This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Stick around to find out more. The untold story of war production. All wars are about competition in production. The side that can produce more is always going to triumph over the other side. Hitler knows he needs industry if he wants to build a war machine. This is a war between the factories. The real story of how the Second World War was fought and won. The United States is about to launch the single greatest program of armament production in human history. They swamped the other side with a tide of mass production. The secret war of the factories that would decide the fate of the whole world. Gotta get back to work. This is the industrial heartland of the American Midwest. Here, a half hour's drive from Detroit, Michigan, sits Willow Run, or what's left of it. We're standing in the final assembly bay of the Willow Run bomber plant built at Willow Run Airport back in 1941. The part we're looking at right now is 144,000 square feet of a 4.2 million square foot factory that was built to produce the B-24 bomber. Like so much of this part of the country, the Willow Run factory has fallen into disrepair, its place in history largely forgotten. But the Ford plant at Willow Run is, perhaps more than any other factory, a symbol of the economic and industrial revolution that won the Allies the war. When Detroit and the factories of the American Midwest were the arsenal of democracy. This building is a manifestation, one of the last one existing, of that miracle of production that took place in the U.S. And it's our duty here at the museum to continue preserving this artifact so that 100 years from now, people will come here and learn of this moment in American history when we stood up to the aggression in the world and made the world a better place, just like they go to Gettysburg today and visit D-Day. But before the great triumph of American industry would come the catastrophic collapse of Europe. May 15, 1940, Winston Churchill has been Prime Minister of Great Britain for five days when he's woken by a phone call from the short-lived Prime Minister of France, Paul Reynaud. We are beaten, he says we have lost the battle. Within a month of this phone call, German troops are marching down the Champs-Élysées. Western Europe has all but fallen. In the Battle of France, the Royal Air Force loses nearly half its aircraft. Britain's shores are left almost undefended. Fewer than 700 Spitfires and Hurricanes remain. Germany and the Luftwaffe are camped across the Channel with a force of over 4,000 fighters and bombers. The speed at which the situation in Europe goes from alarming to critical to virtually hopeless sends shockwaves around the world and to one place in particular, Washington DC. The German Blitzkrieg has shown the world that modern warfare will be a battle for the skies. British factories are working to full capacity to replace their decimated air force. But Britain is vulnerable and Churchill fears that a German invasion may be imminent. Churchill realises um, that they can't manufacture enough aeroplanes to stay in the war, so what he does is send a commissioner to the United States to ask for help. But there's a problem. America may be the world's great producer of motor vehicles, but it is not a nation known for its aircraft. At this point in time, the United States doesn't even have an independent air force. America was by far the most motorized nation on earth. It was the only country where working class, very average people routinely owned a car. Hot ziggity boys, ain't she a dandy? Americans had more experience in using automated factory processes than any other country and doing it on a large scale. But 
there's still relatively few aircraft being manufactured. History Hit is a streaming platform that exclusively releases quality historical documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. From ancient Neolithic cultures to the dawn of the space race, History Hit has thousands of hours of content with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a 14-day free trial and Timeline fans can get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. At uh, the end of the Depression, as World War II breaks out in 1939. In 1940, total American aircraft production is barely 550 a month. Britain once a thousand per month. One of the things you have to realize, which is hard to grasp now, living as we do in a world where the United States spends more money on defense than the rest of the planet put together, is that before Pearl Harbor, the American armed forces, particularly the Army and the Air Force, were minute. Since the 20s, the US has been dramatically scaling back its military. The US, after World War I, became an isolationist nation. And they figured if we never had a military, we would never again become involved in a war. War industries, our only function is to make a profit for their owners in a war setting that hurts everyone. So they shut down all the defense industries. They punished companies who owned production tools to make war weapons. Americans want no more war. Most of all, they want no more participation in foreign wars. Since then, governments had done everything possible to hinder war production. They imposed profit caps on the sale of war materials. They banned the sale of arms to foreign powers. In a few short years, the American war industry is effectively destroyed. But across the Atlantic Ocean, Europe is preparing for war. In May of 1940, the Germans in their blitzkrieg invaded the low countries of France, Belgium, Holland. And this was a wake-up call to the US. Roosevelt is warned that with the current state of the American armed forces, Germany would only need five divisions to take the country. The United States is faced with a difficult decision, bring back the war economy or risk invasion. I ask this Congress for authority and for funds sufficient to manufacture additional munitions and war supplies of many kinds to be turned over to those nations which are now in actual war with aggressor nations. George C. Marshall, head of the army, went to President Roosevelt and said, you've got to bring the industrialists into this mobilization if we're going to succeed. And Roosevelt said, I want the top manufacturing guys in this country. And one of his top advisors said, number one is Bill Knudsen of General Motors. Number two is Bill Knudsen of General Motors. And we can all guess who number three was. Bill Knudsen was the top man at General Motors. He'd emigrated from Denmark at the age of 21. He had little formal education, but had worked his way up to an important role at Ford by 1911. He'd worked for Ford through the company's development into the mass production icons they became, before leaving to become president of Chevrolet, and then General Motors. Knudsen was a famous organizer. He really understood business, industry, and manufacturing like nobody else. But this is going to be an enormous task. You had almost no military infrastructure. There was no large army. There was virtually no air force. It all had to be created from scratch in almost no time at all. And the administration, the government, recognized very realistically that there was just no way they could do this by themselves. What they had to do was to reach out to private industry, uh, the private sector, and divert it to the war effort. Knudsen is going to try something radically different to the other war economies of the world. 
Knudsen is going to keep the American war economy free, unplanned and open. And he will allow the companies they're in to turn a profit. There are two different ways of getting people to do something that you want them to do, and these are famously the carrot and the stick. You can give people orders with the threat of severe sanctions, uh, ultimately being shot if you don't do what you want, or you can give them a reason for doing it because they will gain from doing it. And what the American government basically chose to do during World War II was to rely upon carrots rather than sticks. They provided an enormous carrot in the shape of highly profitable government contracts to produce the material that the war effort required. But despite this new unshackling of American industry, the British are short of options when it comes to fighter planes. There's, at that time, not one single fighter plane being produced in America that would meet the standards required in Europe at the time. Eventually, the British approach a small aviation company called North American Aviation. But at this stage, North American don't produce any fighters, so the British approach them with the designs of a fighter from another company, the Curtis P-40 Warhawk. Mr. Knudsen, America's Beaverbrook, with the assistant war secretary, went to look at the Tomahawk number 2000. North American uh, looking at the designs pretty honestly and, and knowing they're not good enough. So what they say to the British is, do you know what? Give us 120 days and we will build you a prototype of a new fighter. Even for an experienced aircraft company, this would be an exceptionally short window in which to design, construct and fly a brand new fighter. But they're a modern manufacturing company run in the pioneering spirit of the American motor industry. North American actually succeed in churning out a prototype with almost three weeks to spare. And they put it in front of the British and they say, ta-da, the NA-73X. And some brilliant British person says, well, that sounds absolutely rubbish. And uh, eventually we rename it the Mustang. British place an order for 320 aircraft, and North American go into production. The Mustang is a simple but elegant design. It's built making use of all the most recent advances in American vehicle production. By using new lightweight rivets, the Mustang is able to carry a new fuel tank, massively increasing its range. Its various parts are produced separately and joined only later in the process, keeping the final assembly as smooth as possible. It was designed to be mass-produced, it was very successfully mass-produced, but completely set up to run in a different production mode from what was the, the standard or the norm for the British aircraft industry. Designed, drawn and produced within 12 months, which is incredible. You couldn't do that now in 10 years. But in Britain, the reaction to the Mustang is mixed. It is undoubtedly fast with a top speed of 380 miles per hour. It's also highly maneuverable at heights of up to 15,000 feet, but performance tails off dramatically at higher altitudes. As a result, the RAF can only use it for low-level operations, and USAF show no interest in the fighter whatsoever. The Mustang might well have ended up in obscurity had it not been for Ron Harker, who was a test pilot at Rolls-Royce. Harker had joined Rolls-Royce before the war and he'd flown a large number of aircraft and he liked a lot about the P-51, the Mustang. Harker realised that if it had a more powerful engine, the Mustang could actually be a great plane. And of course, because he's working for Rolls-Royce, he knows just the engine, the Rolls-Royce Merlin 61. Everybody knows the Merlin, it powered all our aircraft to a greater or lesser extent. Then they decided to start fitting the Merlin into the Mustang to make that into the fighter it became. The only problem is that Britain simply does not have the capacity to produce enough Rolls-Royce Merlin engines to power these planes. Their only hope is to have the engines produced in the United States. When Bill Knudsen gets the phone call from the British, there's only one company on his list. Who else would you go to to mass produce an engine but Ford? Bill Knudsen is good friends with Henry Ford's son, Edsel, who's by now president of the company. So he gives him a ring and he tells him that Britain has placed an order for 6,000 new Merlin engines. 
Everything seems to be in place when Knudsen receives a call from Edsel Ford. His father, the great Henry Ford, has overruled him. He refuses to make engines for the British war effort. Actually, there are quite a few reasons why Ford will not agree to this. First of all, he's anti-war. He's also a massive isolationist, and he simply doesn't believe that the US should be getting involved. And there's another reason. Ford won't go anywhere near something that had Roosevelt's paw prints on it. In a meeting with Knudsen, Henry Ford vents his fury. He warns Knudsen that he's getting involved with bad people in Washington. Many isolationists see Roosevelt as a tyrant and see this government-backed production program as a play for power. Ford announces to the press that so long as he lives, his company will not supply war materials to foreign powers. He reneges on the deal, and Knudsen will have to look elsewhere. The company he turns to to produce the Merlins is the Packard Motor Company. Packard's vast factory has loomed over the city of Detroit since 1910. Their main trade has always been luxury cars, but they were of Henry Ford's generation and understood the principles by which he worked. But when the plans for the Merlin arrive at Packard, the American engineers are baffled. They'd come expecting a few papers. Instead, the plans fill a crate the size of a freight car. It becomes clear that the British way of doing things is not going to work for the mass production techniques of Packard. Surprising as it may seem, the Packard Motor Company wanted Rolls-Royce to be much more precise in its measurements when it came to the Rolls-Royce Merlin. Why? Because they were building machines to make these engines. They wanted to make them on a very large scale, and they understood very well that mass production was precision production. Measurements are adapted from British to American and broken down into the levels of detail required for mass production. Before long, Merlin engines are rolling off the production line. Rather than the small, highly trained and specialised workforce at the British factories, Packard's production line means they can recruit unskilled labour and produce the Merlins at a rate three times faster than their counterparts. So now the Americans are mass-producing the Merlin engine, but they're also mass-producing the Mustang, and the real game-changer is when they put the two together. The P-51 Mustang, in almost every respect, was superior to the German fighters. It's only by chance that they experimented with this Merlin engine and the P-51 airframe, and you come up with this completely new kind of aircraft. With the support of the American motor industry, the battle for Britain's skies is turning in the Allies' favor. In 1940, German aircraft losses are twice as high as the British, while they struggle to replace them at the same speed. In 1939, Germany produces four times as many aircraft as the United States. By 1941, the US outproduces Germany by 50%. By the end of 1940, Bill Knudsen has already issued billions of dollars worth of war production contracts. The Germans during the Nazi period uh, saw America essentially through the lens of Hollywood uh, and also Jewish banking. They saw the United States as a combination of Jewish finance and decadent Jewish culture. And they simply ignored the enormous productive power and capacity of the American economy. For Hitler and the Nazis, America had been corrupted by Jewish culture. Hollywood was Jewish, capitalism was Jewish, and so, they thought, was America. This is an economy that could produce enormous amounts of consumer goods. That just shows how addicted to comfort the American public are. What they did not realize, of course, was that an economy which was so enormously productive could equally produce enormous amounts of weapons systems uh, and materiel. What the Axis powers realized by the end of 1941 is that the United States industrial program has barely started to realize its potential. And if it ever does reach this potential, they don't stand a chance. Well, the Japanese do see that the Americans have a vast rearmament program, but until that mobilization fully kicked in, which would be a couple of years, Japan had a window where they have tactical superiority. On the 7th of December, 1941, a Japanese force of 400 aircraft launches a preemptive strike on the American naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. 188 aircraft are destroyed, 
along with three battleships. The attack on Pearl Harbor does not affect America's war production. Really, in the long term, all they've done is hack off all of the isolationists that didn't want America to go to war and ensure that basically you've poked the bear. The day after Pearl Harbor, the United States declares war on Japan. Germany and Italy, in their turn, declare war on the United States. At last, America has entered another world war. A national emergency is declared and America goes into full mobilization mode. In an address to the nation, Roosevelt unleashes his plans for the new American war factory. I believe that this nation should plan at this time a program that will provide us with 50,000 military and naval planes. The way that the United States would reach these numbers would change the relationship between government and big business forever. Immediately before Pearl Harbor, relations between the American political class in the shape of Franklin Roosevelt and his government and the American business class were probably at an all-time low. The business class felt that they had an administration that was ideologically hostile to their interests and to the very existence of a free market economy. Then, like a bolt from a blue, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. And quite suddenly, everything is changed. Now was the time to actually reach out to uh, large business in particular, uh, make a deal with them and bring them on board as part of a process of producing what was needed uh, to win the war effort. As a wartime president, Roosevelt is first and foremost a pragmatist. He now puts his faith in Knudsen and the business leaders of the country. I think the way to understand the working of the US war production system is that it's essentially a kind of corporate capitalist model of the economy. It's not a radical free enterprise approach, but at the same time, it is an explicit rejection of a command socialist economy. Since the German failure to take control of the skies in the Battle of Britain, the tide has been beginning to turn against the Luftwaffe. The Battle of Britain was won by the few. The Spitfires and hurricanes that rose up in the sky were defensive weapons to defend England. The four-engine bomber had been identified as the offensive weapon that would take the war to Germany. And the demand for four-engine bombers outstripped manufacturing by Ian's. The Allies desperately need a new bomber, and in vast numbers. The only bomber that might fit the bill is the B-24. It carried more, it went further, and it went faster. They wanted the B-24 by the tens of thousands. But in 1941, American industry is still in a state of decline. The depression and stagnation of the 1930s has left industry crippled. New Deal profit caps and over-unionization had held back industry since Roosevelt had taken power. American industry might be willing and able, but it wasn't ready when war was declared. The knock-on effects of the Great Depression mean that America is lagging behind in industry. In 1929, US machine tool sales had amounted to $185 million. By 1932, there were only 22 million. America's factories are ill-equipped for the shift in production that lies ahead, and the startup costs for producing 125,000 planes a year would be enormous. To handle an operation on this scale, Knudsen knows he will need an experienced manufacturer. Once again, he turns to Ford. Ford remained reluctant to enter the military economy, but after the German declaration of war, there can be no more question. Selling arms to the British Empire is one thing, but providing weapons in the defense of his own nation is another. Now that the US has officially declared war, Ford finally agrees to be part of the war economy. But he doesn't want to build engines or parts. He and his team are going to be building planes. This factory will be called Willow Run, and it's going to be bigger than any factory ever built before. The first thing that has to be done is to work out a production process for the new Ford-produced B-24s. And the man that Ford sends to observe the US Air Force's current operation is Charles Sorensen. <laughs> 
otherwise known as Cast Iron Charlie. Charles Sorensen was an old-time Ford employee. He'd been at Ford 35 years, and he'd worked his way from pattern maker to vice president of manufacturing. He was the guy that designed the Model T line. He mastered cast iron in place of forging. He was a master of manufacturing. What he saw at the consolidated B24 factory was a complete disaster. Sorensen went back to the Coronado Hotel, which still stands in San Diego. And after dinner, he went to his room and he took his notes from the day. And he started on small scraps of paper, flows to the middle of the room, parts to minor assemblies, major assemblies, sub-assemblies. And at four in the morning, he had designed a factory that would build one B-24 bomber an hour. And the Army said, start this project right now on the basis of pencil drawings on the back of hotel placemats the Army awarded a $200 million contract to start the Willow Run Bomber Factory. The B-24 would be the Ford Model T of the sky. Charles Sorensen will build his new factory here in the industrial suburbs of Detroit. It will be called Willow Run, and it will be unlike anything the world has seen. The B-24 Liberators they'll be constructing here consist of nearly 500,000 different parts and components. Sorensen breaks down the assembly of these parts into a few thousand sequences that will themselves be divided into nine different departments. The part we're looking at right now is 144,000 square feet of a 4.2 million square foot factory that was built to produce the B-24 bomber. This is about 5% of the original factory. There were two 3,500 foot assembly lines that started and moved these airplanes through the factory assembly line station, one movement per hour till they came out the door. But while Willow Run is an incredible sight to behold, its production levels are falling well under what Sorensen had promised the US Air Force and it's becoming a serious problem. Will It Run did not get off the flying start. In fact, it earned the nickname, Will It Run. The timetable they had built, which would allow them to start making production tooling to build airplanes, was based upon the blueprints they developed in San Diego in early 1940, but the airplane had been modified so much that much of the blueprints were obsolete, and they had to go back and redesign the airplane. The B-24s were not cars. The technology was state-of-the-art and still being perfected. It's not an easy leap to sort of be making door panels for a car one day and then making wing ribs or putting together a, a flap or an aileron for an aircraft a couple of weeks later. The tolerances are far, far greater. The materials are much tougher to work with. Yes, you're still dealing with drilling holes in lumps of metal, but the finish, the finesse, the limits involved are world away. In desperation, Sorensen turns to his old rival at General Motors, Bill Knudsen. World War II is full of cases where attempts are made to mass produce that essentially fail. And the Willow Run factory is one example. It's very easy to turn out identical aeroplanes. But if you need to go back and change them, you lose the advantage that you get from producing in the large scale in the first place. Knudsen sees that constant revision to the designs of the B-24 makes keeping the production moving almost impossible. So Ford went to Consolidated and said, I can build bombers if you freeze the design of the airplane. I can't build a 1936 Ford and then a 1937 Ford, and then a 1935 Ford on a moving assembly line. I will build 400 bombers. No changes to these bombers. Once they agreed to freeze the design of the airplane, now they could schedule production, and the production line took off to match the bomber per hour prediction that Sorensen made. In January 1943, only 31 Liberators are completed at Willow Run. But in February, they produce 74. In March, 104. By the end of the year, Willow Run is achieving the incredible output Sorensen had promised, and then some. At its peak, 
650 B-24s are rolling out the doors of Willow Run every month. A Liberator had cost 200,000 hours from start to finish before Willow Run. Sorensen, Knudsen and Ford cut this time by 90%. Ford Motor Company built about 8,700 B-24 bombers here. These right here are the doors that would open once per hour to let the B-24 bombers come off the assembly line. 6,700 of them flew away from this airport. I'm awestruck by the industrial giants of Detroit when they understood how to produce a product. By now, American bomber production is dwarfing the Germans. By far the most widely produced German bomber class was the Junkers. The US produces almost twice this number of B-24s. The B-24s will be the most widely produced bomber in the war. Almost half are built at Willow Run. This new plane can carry four tons of bombs, and the Allied Air Forces make the most of its destructive capacity, raining fire upon the cities of Europe, North Africa, and Asia. But while Ford and the men and women of Willow Run have been constructing the largest class of bombers ever assembled, another bomber has already been in the works for several years. In strict secrecy, Boeing have been developing a bomber since before Pearl Harbor that could change the course of the war. They would call the plane the B-29 or the Super Fortress. By 1944, the Nazi stranglehold on Europe is starting to weaken. Thousands of aircraft swarm the skies and the Allies prepare for the end. But on the other side of the world, the war is only intensifying. As the Americans press further into the Japanese Empire, the casualties on both sides are enormous. Japan is problematic because it's a coastal empire um, comprising hundreds of islands. They're fiercely defended, and every time you land on one, it's going to cost you dearly. Defeating the entire Japanese empire, you're potentially looking at a cost of millions of men. Without a vast invasion force, the only way to reach Japan is with a bomber. But this job is well beyond the B-24. The only bomber capable of reaching Japan is the newly developed B-29. The B-24 is a very complex aircraft, but now you move to the B-29. The B-29 requires literally thousands of changes and adaptations during its design career. Boeing's B-29 has been in development since the start of the war, but progress has been slow, and millions have been poured into the project before a prototype ever leaves the ground. In almost every respect, it is a totally new conception of what a bomber can be. From engine power, weight, to wing loading, remote controlled gun turrets, and cabin pressurization. The B-29 bomber was the most advanced airplane in the world at the time it was being designed and built. And it was the foundation of the airline industry following World War II. But the early designs are riddled with problems and over the meatpacking district of Seattle in December 1943, disaster strikes. During a test flight in Seattle, the lead B-29 prototype suffers this appalling engine cooling failure shortly after it takes off. And as it tries to come into land, all these witnesses can see smoke billowing from this engine. Now, the pilot's a man called Edmund T. Allen. He's immensely experienced. He's the lead test pilot on the program and the man who knows more than anyone else about the project. But as this aircraft is kind of storming towards the runway, even he can't control it. And the B-29 suddenly veers off course. It cuts through these power lines above Seattle streets and it hurtles into the side of this local office build. By the end of 1943, only 15 airworthy B-29s had been delivered. They're implementing technologies that haven't ever been used on aircraft before. Um, and that's not just for a prototype, they're at the same time envisaging that they will have to mass produce this and turn them out at a rapid rate as well. It's a completely chaotic process bringing the B-29 into being. When they do though, it's remarkable how quickly they can turn them out. <laughs> 
After four years of work, Boeing finalized their design for the B-29 in 1943. Now they can draw up plans for factory production. Boeing quickly realized that they need entirely new warehouses for the Superfortress's assembly. No plant that they, or indeed anyone else has access to, will suffice for a project of this scale. To make matters even more complicated, it will all have to take place in total secrecy. The whole project is becoming so fiendishly complicated that the War Production Board won't go anywhere near it. So in the end, the production plan uh, will be this incredible coordinated project of Boeing, along with North American, Bell Aircraft, Wright Aeronautics and General Motors. The site chosen for Boeing's new plant is just outside the little town of Wichita, Kansas. Wright Aeronautics will work on the engines in Patterson, New Jersey, while General Motors will operate another smaller plant in Cleveland, Ohio. This is rapidly becoming the largest and most expensive project in aeronautics history. They were building a plane for the Army Air Forces that would reduce the huge fortresses and liberators to medium bombers. They were building the Boeing-designed B-29 Super Fortress. The production line they design at Boeing in Wichita completely eclipses Henry Ford's Willow Run factory. It's to build the B-29, which has got more than double the amount of parts of a B-24, over a million rivets, and they even have to instigate a new process um, to be able to mass produce them, and that's called multi-lining. In the multi-lining process, six assembly lines work in tandem, eventually joining at their ends and merging to form three lines, which finally come to a head at the vast main warehouse of the plant. There, four whole superfortresses would be pulled together by dozens of cranes and hundreds of workers, all dwarfed by the scale of their equipment. To keep the production line moving, they have to ensure that the 1,400 different suppliers of all the various parts that went into the assembly were also functioning smoothly and on time. This means General Electric, Bendix, DuPont and Goodyear. One stoppage in the chain could bring the entire assembly line to a standstill. This was, by 1943, not only the most expensive aeroplane ever produced, but the most expensive machine of any kind. Despite this, the production speed is incredible the 150th B-29 rolls off the assembly line in April 1944, but within a year, 2,000 have been built. By the beginning of 1944, you know that Japan are done, but it's still costing an obscene amount in men and material um, to continue fighting there with the result that the American solution is just, instead of trying to overcome the Japanese forces in Japan, is just to bomb the living daylights out of them. So with this new fleet of super fortresses, the B-29, they know that they can sort of dull Japan into submission swiftly. In July and August, the Americans capture Saipan, Guam and Tinian in the Mariana Islands, far closer to Japan and five new airfields are hastily built to accommodate 180 super fortresses and the men of the newly created 20th Air Force. The man transferred to take control of the B-29 campaign is General Curtis LeMay. Curtis LeMay um, surmises that most Japanese cities and towns are constructed mainly of wood, so obviously wood doesn't like fire. So incendiary bombing, um, will be the way to go. LeMay's first superfortress firebombing attack is planned for Tokyo on the 9th of March 1945. He sends 334 B-29s armed with 2,000 tons of incendiaries. They reach the city under the cover of darkness and unleash hell on the unsuspecting population. Several hundred B-29s firebomb Tokyo and destroy 16 square miles of Tokyo in one raid as also the highest casualties of any single aircraft raid. These firebombing raids are horrific. It was said that you could still smell burning human flesh with a B-29 landed back at the base. But it is only a hint of the destructive power the Superfortress has unleashed 
At 8 a.m. on the 6th of August, 1945, an atomic bomb is dropped from the bomb bay of a B-29 over the city of Hiroshima. Two accompanying B-29s record the event. Who knows what revolution it may affect in the life of the individual, in the organization of the world. Already, people are calling this the atomic era. Some 70,000 people are killed instantly. 70,000 more will die in the coming weeks and months from their injuries or from radiation sickness. Japan surrenders nine days later. The war is over. Bill Knudsen is in Germany when he hears of Japan's surrender, but this was, of course, never in doubt. Knudsen had left his post some months before the end of the war. His work had already been done. Under his system, the United States had produced 324,700 aircraft. 170 airplanes had consistently rolled out of American factories every day since the beginning of 1942. In 1939, the Japanese were producing twice the number of aircraft as the Americans. The Germans were producing four times as many. By 1945, the Americans are outproducing both of them by a factor of six. The legacy of Little Run is, in a world gone mad, the institution of democracy was under a tremendous threat. And they turned to the masters of manufacturing in Detroit, who understood how to mass produce the machinery that would be needed to protect freedom and allow the world to move forward. What Knudsen had completely understood was that total state control, a command economy like Nazi Germany, was not in wartime or any other time the key to productivity. In fact, the very opposite was true. What Knudsen really does for the United States is to pull off the shackles that American industry had been stuck with since the New Deal. As the many millions of American veterans return home, they find a country transformed. It's not only in how much they produce in America um, that, that symbolizes victory. The total economic output for America had doubled. Wages had risen by 70%. So to all intents and purposes, the depression and the economic decline that they were suffering when they got involved in the war has been eradicated. Unemployment is virtually non-existent. The factories that had converted themselves to war production convert themselves back, and they stay open. When Ford released their first car model since the war, there are lines of people in the street. The rebirth of American industry would continue for two decades and propel the United States to become the most powerful country the world had ever seen. The world's first superpower. But Bill Knudsen did not live to see any of this. In 1947, he died in his family home in Detroit, only a few miles from the factories that made him. He's going to triumph over the other side. Hitler knows he needs industry if he wants to build a war machine. This is a war between the factories. The real story of how the Second World War was fought and one. The United States is about to launch the single greatest program of armament production in human history. They swamped the other side with a tide of mass production. The secret war of the factories that would decide the fate of the whole world. Gotta get back to work. Today, the Baltimore docks are quiet. The water is still, the quayside largely deserted. But on the 27th of September, 1941, these docks were thronging with people. Thousands of workers gathered to celebrate the launch of a new ship, the first of a new kind of ship that will change the course of history. They will be called Liberty Ships. Though they will play a key role in the Allied victory in World War II, only three Liberty Ships survive. Captain Brian Hope is dedicated to preserving this incredible bit of maritime history. Liberty ships are, the general category is a merchant ship. They're designed to carry cargo. Two-thirds of all the cargo 
that left the United States during World War II was carried in Liberty ships. Every conceivable kind of cargo, from beans to bullets, absolutely crucial to the winning of the war. If we didn't have a merchant fleet, then no victory. More than any other single vessel, the mass production of Liberty ships reflected the astonishing industrial might of America. Today we have a little less than 100 American flag merchant ships. At the end of World War II, we had slightly less than 6,000 ships. It was a shipbuilding effort literally beyond belief. At the end of the war, their work done, shipyards like this one would close or shrink. But in the war years, they would see a flurry of industrial activity, the likes of which the world has never seen before or since. The story of the American shipyard is the story of how the Allies won the war. But the story begins on the other side of the Atlantic. In the summer of 1940, Britain is fighting desperately to stay in the war. The speed of the German advance through northern Europe has caught the Western democracies completely off guard. France has fallen, and Britain's skies are overrun with Nazi aircraft. It sees are patrolled day and night by wolf packs of ship-killing U-boats. In the summer of 1940, the German forces are across the Channel, and they've got much greater access for their aircraft and their U-boats and warships via Norway or via the French coast. So suddenly the war is on our doorstep. The threat goes up exponentially from 1940 onwards, particularly as Germany can produce more U-boats. The U-boat campaign leads to the sinking of a very considerable proportion of all British shipping and creates a potential crisis in the British capacity to import. Britain is a small island nation cut off from Europe, desperately relying on trade with America. Its merchant fleet is its lifeline. Without imports of food and supplies, Britain will collapse. But in 1941 alone, German U-boats sink 1,300 ships. Month after month, hundreds of thousands of tons of British imports are being sent to the bottom of the sea. In desperation, Churchill turns to the Americans. The British need freight ships, and they need them fast. Though America is not yet at war, it's willing to help its closest ally. But American shipyards are too few and too busy. They have no merchant ships to spare. So the British offer to pay for the rapid construction of new shipyards. The man they turn to is Henry J. Kaiser. In true American tradition, Kaiser is actually a completely self-made man. He had left school and skipped town when he was just 13. And within 10 years, he's running his own construction company. Kaiser had been in the interwar period a sort of a celebrity businessman. He'd worked on some of the great projects, these huge kinds of federal projects which changed the landscape. One of the largest things ever built by man was the Hoover Dam. Kaiser had no education and no training, but in the Hoover Dam he built one of the great man-made wonders of the world. He'd started out with nothing, but he had an incredible natural talent for organization and a sheer bloody-minded determination to get on and make money. As war approaches, British and American governments will turn to men like Henry Kaiser to build their armies and their fleets. One of the basic decisions that the War Planning Board and the administration make is that they are going to encourage companies to produce the goods, materials they need by making it profitable for them to do so, by offering them generous contracts and terms which will give them a business financial incentive. So a large number of firms actually are set up during the war on the back of uh, taking on war contracts and then uh, delivering the goods, so to speak. One of the best known examples is the Henry J. Kaiser shipyards. Kaiser offers to build shipyards and then ships. Kaiser has barely been on a ship, let alone built one. But then he didn't know anything about dams, and that didn't stop him. He's not naturally a shipbuilder, but he's used to big, ambitious projects. And what he sees is an opportunity now to take his skills and move them into shipbuilding. Kaiser is not a qualified engineer, but understands the principles of mass production. He just needs a contract to prove that the same methods can be applied to ships. 
Kaiser meets with the British, who already have a design for a simple, basic freight ship. Based on the SS Empire Liberty, these designs would inspire the largest single class of ship ever produced, the Liberty Ship. They're described by President Roosevelt as ugly ducklings. So they are blunt ships, they are crude ships, they have relatively austere accommodation, they don't have great sea keeping, they don't have great speed, but you can produce them quickly and they will take a large volume of cargo for their size. Kaiser tells the British he can build them large numbers of Liberty ships in record time, but only if he's allowed to do it his way. The British are skeptical. Britain is the world's great naval superpower. They've been building ships for hundreds of years. Henry Kaiser, a man with no shipbuilding experience, is telling them he can do it better. Nevertheless, Kaiser gets the contract and buys land to build a new shipyard here, on the mudflats of Richmond, on the San Francisco Bay. Well, Kaiser is terribly ambitious and willing to take risks. So what he realizes is you need to set up the infrastructure to build the ship. And you're building ships on a scale never uh, heretofore attempted. And he's willing to do that, starting in a sense from scratch, so he can change the productive process. Kaiser is told by engineering experts that it will take six months to dredge the Santa Fe Channel and clear enough land to start work on the shipyard. Kaiser's men do it in three weeks. Incredibly, Kaiser builds his first shipyard in just three months. It opens its gates in April 1941. It hasn't just gone up quicker than other shipyards. Ships will be made here like they've never been made before. He can see an efficiency in having a production system that is designed from day one to deal with the bringing in and assembly of subcomponents. Once this production line is up and running, it will be able to become rapid mass production. Kaiser's new shipyards will be unlike any other shipyard in the country, because Kaiser is not a shipbuilder. Instead, he has modeled his yards on the warehouses of Motor City and the production lines of Ford and General Motors. These automobile companies completely changed the game in their own industry, producing motor cars for mass consumption. The processes they developed remain much the same today. America has been turning out, probably more than any other economy, a large number of very standardized products in large scale. And those methods are then applied to wartime. So effectively, this is providing Ford manufacturing production techniques to the shipbuilding industry. What the American production begins to favor as the war goes on is the idea of welding. So instead of putting all these rivets, you would actually use acetylene torches or different kinds of heat sources to melt the metal together. Riveting requires four men, welding only two. It takes six months to train a riveter, a welder only three. Welding allows Kaiser to turn shipbuilding into a production line, breaking up complex tasks into a series of simpler ones. Instead of crafting one ship at a time, Kaiser will mass produce them in sections, then weld them together. Once you move to sectional construction and welding, you can put together components from a wide range of places that are just brought together for the final construction. And so potentially you can speed up the construction of simpler ships very, very quickly. The man who built Boulder Dam has revolutionized shipbuilding. From blueprint to template, Henry J. Kaiser's West Coast Yards are sliding Liberty ships into the water as from an assembly line. A triumph of American genius and popular science. To the disbelief of traditional shipbuilders, Kaiser's first Liberty ship is constructed in just 124 days. Now, this new Liberty ship is assembled a bit like flat pack furniture, piece by piece. 95% of each ship would be pre-assembled. But you've got to remember, a 14,000 ton ship has a lot of parts. The finished hull of a Liberty ship is made of steel plates cut into no fewer than 435 shapes and sizes. Each ship contains 7,500 different mechanical components supplied by 600 different producers across the country. But by dividing up the production process and building ships in parts, a complex process is made simple. <laughs> 
what the Americans do essentially is to apply the techniques that American industry had already developed to the mass production of consumer goods to the production of munitions uh, and war supplies. And so essentially it's the great triumph of American mass production capitalism. Liberty ships have kept Britain alive and in the war. Soon they will be transporting supplies to American troops abroad and vast numbers of American weapons and vehicles to help the Red Army. Liberty ships are absolutely critical in keeping uh, the Allies in the war. British fighter planes came over from America, Russian tanks, and, and most of them are carried on Liberty ships. Captain Brian Hope works aboard the Liberty ship, the SS John W. Brown in Baltimore. The John W. Brown is 75 years old. Uh, and uh, she's not a spring chicken anymore, but we keep her in as good a condition as we possibly can. The space is called the tween deck, which means it's between the main deck and the ship's lower hold. Only on the inside of the Liberty ship does its scale become apparent. There we go. The SS John W. Brown staffed 45 merchant seamen and 41 Navy guards. Fully loaded, she could carry almost 3,000 jeeps. There we go. This is the number three lower hold. This is one of the five cargo holds on the ship. Uh, of course, it's empty now. We use it for storage. But when the, when the ship was filled with cargo, the water line was way up near the top of this hold. This hold is actually one of the smaller holds on the ship, believe it or not. The purpose of the Liberty ships was to get cargo from the United States to the battlefronts, and the cargo was carried in these holds. So this hold represents the uh, victory for the Allies in uh, World War II. But across the Pacific, war is about to find America, whether they want it or not. The United States is about to launch the single greatest program of armament production in human history. America will never be the same again. The USS Arizona Memorial, Pearl Harbor, Honolulu. In the waters below lies the wreck of the Arizona, on which over a thousand American servicemen lost their lives. The attack on Pearl Harbor does not affect America's war production. Really, in the long term, all they've done is hack off all of the isolationists that didn't want America to go to war and ensure that it, basically you've poked the bear. Japan knows that if America can produce warships with the same mass production techniques they've used for the Liberty ships, they will be unbeatable. So Japan decides to strike first. The Japanese do see that the Americans have a vast rearmament program, which was voted in by Congress to expand the Navy and the Army and the, and the Air Force. But until that mobilization fully kicked in, which would be a couple of years, Japan had a window with its 10 carriers, would have approximately parity at the opening with the Western powers. Now, every month, that you go past December 1941, the power ratio starts moving away from the Japanese. Four days later, Germany declares war on the United States. Against all its best intentions, America has been dragged into yet another world war. In January 1942, Roosevelt addresses the nation. He announces a vast expansion of the American shipbuilding program. These figures will give the Japanese and the Nazis a little idea of just what they accomplished in the attack at Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt sees the astonishing progress made by the Kaiser shipyards. So instead of the Navy building ships, he plans to open up American shipbuilding to private industry. It's a way of thinking about the war productive effort as being like a competitive mass production market in which you have large firms which compete to supply the needs of this market. Consumer is the US government. Roosevelt's New Deal had been anti-business. It had suppressed competition and confiscated profits, regulated output and prices. 
Now, faced with war, all of these government controls have been swept aside. In every other country, war brings more government control. In America, it brings more freedom. And the results are electrifying. As Kaiser wins orders, he'll need to attract tens of thousands more workers. But the Richmond shipyard is miles from any major town or city. Well, there was a demand, of course, for uh, workers in all sorts of uh, war industries at the time. It truly was competition. Uh, there were great deals available to work in the aviation industry, building airplanes. So the shipyard workers uh, were offered better deals to come and work in the shipyards. To tempt workers to his shipyards, Kaiser introduces a healthcare scheme covering them and their families' medical costs for 80 cents a week. 91% of the employees subscribe, making it the largest voluntary health plan in America. Kaiser Healthcare begins as a way to protect his own workers' health. And from that, he creates a healthcare company. He basically franchises it out as a private insurance scheme. It still exists to this day. It's one of the best healthcare systems in America. With the offer of high wages, medical benefits, and the promise of learning a trade, workers flock to Kaiser's shipyards from all over America. This sudden explosion of industry is providing jobs in numbers the United States hasn't seen since the Great Depression. As Henry Kaiser's new shipyard expands, the population of the surrounding areas soars. The little town of Richmond experiences a population boom of over 600% in just three years. By 1943, it's grown to a town of 150,000. Kaiser and the Maritime Commission start work on the construction of 23,000 new homes to cope with the sudden migration of workers to the Richmond area. This didn't just involve putting up houses for 30,000 people in the middle of nowhere. This meant creating an infrastructure of ferries, buses, trains, anything nearby to help move people in order to get them to factories. Richmond shipbuilders top the nation in the share of the ride principle, averaged more than four riders per car. Because of the shift patterns that everyone's working, it means that uh, cinemas, restaurants, bars, shops, will need to be open 24 seven. It really did create a lively place to be. They just treated the, the workers uh, exceptionally well. They advertised to a great extent uh, all over the country for uh, people to come and work in the shipyards. A lot of black workers were recruited from the South and they moved up to Baltimore. They were integrated very well into, into the workforce. There was a large proportion of women in the shipyards maybe close to 25 percent of the workers were female and they did just about every job in the shipyard. They ran cranes, they, they served as guards, uh, they drove trucks, they did all sorts of jobs. To accommodate the large number of women now working on the ships, daycare centers are introduced to look after the children. Women are free to work alongside their husbands, often for the first time in their lives. New schools are opened as well and filled almost instantly by the children of shipyard workers. This is a time of incredibly rapid social change. America's Great Depression is finally coming to a close. In 1933, only 50,000 shipyard workers had been employed. Ten years later, 1.7 million people are working in shipyards across the country. Actually, funnily enough, standards of living in the United States actually increase quite dramatically after the beginning of the war everyone's in employment and wages are rising year on year. So actually this is truly a sort of rebirth for America. But on the other side of the ocean, the Japanese stranglehold over the countries of the Asia Pacific grows ever tighter. Well, the Japanese are obsessed by the fact that they have a small island country with limited resources and they believe to be equal to a great power, which is where they should be in the world in their view, that they must have the resources of their own. Today, Tokyo is one of the largest cities on the planet. Now, as in 1940, built up urban areas cover the islands of Japan. Like Britain, wartime Japan is not self-sufficient. 
either in food or raw materials. Instead, it would extract the supplies it needs from the populations of its new overseas colonies in China, Korea and Southeast Asia. The Japanese are quite ruthless in how they get hold of all the raw materials and food that they need in that they just go out and pillage it from everywhere in the Pacific. And they're utterly reliant on their own merchant fleet to bring it home. To feed itself and maintain its empire, Japan needs to control Pacific shipping lanes. Without its merchant fleet, Japan's empire will collapse. What the Allies swiftly realize is that if they can disrupt Japanese supply lines, just as the U-boats had done to Britain, they'll be completely unable to sustain their war effort. Their many overseas colonies are going to count for nothing. America does have submarines with the range required to reach the Japanese merchant fleet, some 4,000 miles away, but it doesn't have many of them. This is the Gato-class submarine. The Gato-class submarine has been around since the beginning of the war. Um, the Americans have only ever produced a handful of them, and the reason is that they're completely labour-intensive and not geared up for mass production at all. For mass production to make economic sense, you need to be producing large numbers of identical items or machines. So if you're going to invest huge amounts of money in machine tools that only produce parts in small numbers, it's simply not worth the investment. That's common sense. When the designs are finalised, um, that's when you begin sending prototypes out to manufacturers. And to get them done in sufficient numbers and create a submarine fleet from scratch, they're going to have to employ Kaiser's methods. Before long, five different contractors are mass-producing Gatos across the country. The first Gato is completed in November 1941. In January 1942, American shipyards are producing two Gatos a month. By the summer, they are sending out a new Gato every eight days. The Gato class is America's first mass-produced submarine. The impact on the Japanese merchant fleet is felt immediately. Dozens of merchant ships are lost within a few months, disrupting Japanese supply lines and damaging military production. Submarines account for less than 2% of US naval vessels, but they will be responsible for 30% of all Japanese ships sunk. The United States submarine was a hugely important weapon of war in the East. They essentially destroyed the Japanese capacity to transport goods and troops uh, in the Pacific. Large parts of the Japanese Empire are effectively separated from Japan long before the end of the war, and Japanese ability to produce anything at home and even to feed the home island is falling catastrophically. For the loss of only 52 submarines, the fleet wipes out over a thousand Japanese ships, half their merchant fleet, five million tons of vital Japanese shipping. But to hit mainland Japan directly, something else, something bigger, will be needed. In the autumn of 1942, Roosevelt visits Kaiser's shipyard in Oregon. By now, Kaiser and the Liberty ship's success have become a national sensation. Roosevelt's tour of the yard is like a victory parade. Addressing the crowd, the president says, I wish that every man, woman, and child in the United States could have been here today to see that launching and realize what it means in the winning of this war. At the start of 1942, the construction of a Liberty ship had taken an average of 210 days. By May, 156. By July, 106, and some are produced in just a few days. And Henry Kaiser is becoming a national celebrity. Jay Kaiser, the miracle shipbuilder, shows how his yards launch Liberty ships in record time. The man who cuts months to weeks. Now you're talking about ships being turned out, you know, in the matter of just over a month from the starting of a ship for getting it to sea in order to fit it out. In 1942, Germany produces 244 major vessels, Japan only 68. But this is dwarfed by the output of the US shipyards, which produce an incredible 1,854. Liberty ships have been great for keeping Britain and her allies in the war in terms of going across the Atlantic. Um, once the war in the Pacific explodes, 
they're no longer enough. Um, Kaiser's shipyards are going to have to up their production significantly once again. Pearl Harbor showed that naval warfare had changed. A modern navy needs planes. Battleships on their own are slow and vulnerable. The battleship's day had passed, the battleship was there, it could bombard beaches, but in terms of ship-to-ship -ship combat, aircraft carriers were now the key weapons. So what Kaiser wants to show is he can now build those as well. The need for aircraft carriers is obvious, but carriers are enormous. The Essex class, the United States' favoured ship, is 900 feet long. It weighs 30,000 tonnes and has a crew of 2,500 men. A single carrier this size takes literally years to build, and war in the Pacific will not wait. As the war goes on, though, these ships will take several years to produce and can only be in a handful of places working with the main battle fleet. So you start looking at what were called escort carriers. So they're much smaller, and they're operating perhaps 20 aircraft compared to the 60 or 70 aircraft on a fleet carrier. Kaiser offers to build the Navy aircraft carriers the same way he builds Liberty ships. They'll be smaller than the Navy's existing carriers, but Kaiser will build many more of them at a much faster rate. Kaiser is a self-made man, um, very rich man, very successful man, and there's consequently a lot of ego and bravado that goes with him. And when he goes to put a bid in front of the US Navy to produce escort carriers, he just rubs them completely up the wrong way with the result that they just turn him down flat. Kaiser has spent an entire career schmoozing Washington, so being rejected by the head of the Navy board is like, pfft. So all he does instead is just set up a meeting with Roosevelt and have another chat, and then with, with the instant result that he's uh, got a contract to produce 50 escort carriers. Kaiser's new mass-produced escort carriers would be known as Casablanca-class carriers. The Kaiser shipyard set to work immediately, organizing the most efficient production line possible for their new carriers. Every ship will be standardized, every part mass-produced, each ship running with reciprocating steam engines with four boilers. No variation, no frills, with lighter armor and increased speed. Again, they could be made in a much wider range of shipyards, following the example of things like the Liberty ships. You're producing a simple ship that you can put a simple flight deck on and you can operate for a limited number of tasks, 20 aircraft. So we have a kind of mass production of small ships rather than the building of a very few, very large ships. But shipbuilders build ships. They don't do lighting, they don't do radar, and they don't do radios. Within the ship's enormous outer shell, a vast infrastructure of electrical components needs to be provided. To assemble the inner workings of their ships, naval yards across the country turned to manufacturing giant General Electric. They churned out a lot. Ships radios, searchlights, winches, ammunition hoists. They even organized ventilation, steering control, and even radar equipment. Now this coordination and cooperation between companies simply does not happen in a planned economy. What Kaiser says is that we need someone producing the lighting for his ships and he goes straight to General Electric. He needs electrical components for cranes, he goes to General Electric. The Kaiser shipyards can only run because of this coordination with their many hundreds of subcontractors. The first aircraft carrier to be launched from the yard of Henry Kaiser. Now geared for mass production, America's miracle shipbuilder promises to deliver six carriers a month. General Electric and the Kaiser shipyards keep to their deadlines. They produce a staggering 50 escort carriers in two years. Over the course of the entire war, Japan only produces seven. Kaiser breaks all records. More Casablanca carriers are built than any other kind of aircraft carrier before or since and they wreak havoc in the Pacific. US fighter planes swarm the slow and hulking Japanese battleships. This is Chuuk Lagoon. It was once the main base for the Japanese Imperial Fleet. It is now home to the Ghost Fleet. Operation Hailstone, I'd say it's revenge for Pearl Harbor. 
1944, 540 American aircraft um, take off from carriers and proceed to destroy the Japanese fleet. Over 200,000 tons of Japanese shipping is lost to the bottom of the sea and 17,000 tons of fuel destroyed. Operation Hailstone is the death knell for the Japanese fleet. The next step for the Americans will be invasion, but getting to dry land won't be so easy. By the middle of the war, American military production is dwarfing that of Japan. In 1943, Japan produces 122 major naval vessels. America builds a staggering 2,654. Identical ships with identical walkways unload identical stores in identical ways. Under this new production program, crews and troops need less familiarization and can operate more efficiently. But the fighting in the approach to Japan is brutal. In their advance across the islands of the Pacific, each landing is like breaching a castle. As the Allied troops try to land their ships on Japanese beaches, they're greeted with volleys of bullets. You can isolate the islands that the Japanese forces are on, but there's no deception about where you're going to land, and generally there are very limited areas. In the Pacific, as the Americans realize, you have coral atolls, you have much more difficult landing operations, often sort of smaller, patchier beaches. Reefs just offshore from the beach that can wreck normal landing craft coming in. The landings in Tarawa in 1943 end up being a disaster. Something must be done to limit the American losses, and fast. The solution lies with a hard-drinking Irishman named Andrew Jackson Higgins, who lived and worked here in Bayou Country, Louisiana. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, Higgins had supplied the developing oil and gas wells. To service these sites, he had designed and built several shallow draft craft capable of carrying heavy loads in depths of less than two feet of water. Now, Higgins has read about the problems faced by the American troops in those early Pacific landings, and he realizes that these boats of his could be the answer. They could actually save American lives. Higgins' boats are tested, effective, and can be easily mass-produced. But once again, the government's monolithic military bureaucracy has other ideas. Somewhat predictably, you've got these bureaucrats at the US Navy board who are absolutely determined to use the landing craft that they'd commissioned and designed internally, despite the fact they were obviously bad. So what they do is they continue to purchase thousands of these inferior internally designed ships even though it's costing American lives. Now, this is a theme that you see going on throughout the entire war. You've got this real pushback of army bureaucrats against the expansion of military production into the private sector. Now, that, of course, is going against men like Higgins and Kaiser, who really know what they're doing. But Higgins, like Kaiser, is not easily beaten. He demands that Congress investigate the Navy board and wins a hearing with Senator Harry Truman. Truman himself was no great fan of the New Deal. And Truman was uh, certainly on the side of the conservative Democrats in the 1940s that thought that uh, the staunch Roosevelt Democrats had gone too far with government regulations. Truman calls for a head-to-head -head operational test, the Navy's boat versus Higgins. So what happens is when they pitch the two designs up against each other, uh, everything that Higgins would have wished for happens. So um, he shows the Navy designers up as, as vastly inferior. His design dazzles everybody. Truman is stunned by the corruption of the Navy board. He launches a full-scale investigation and concludes that the Navy board have shown a flagrant disregard for the facts, if not the safety and success of American troops. Higgins is awarded the contract to mass-produce his design. D-Day happens in June 1944. A few weeks later, the United States invades the Marianas Islands, Saipan, Tinian, and Guam. They send a naval force 10 times larger. 
to invade those islands than they send to D-Day. The US fleet has already grown to become the largest ever assembled. They're transporting hundreds of thousands of troops and tens of thousands of tanks, trucks, and transports. The problem is how to get this vast floating army ashore. You need to build more complex landing craft that can carry heavy loads. And you need to build those in a way that had never been conceived of before. And Kaiser, yet again, begins to involve himself in the building of these more intricate landing craft. The solution is the landing ship tank. LST is a landing ship tank, and it's, it's one of the best inventions of the war. They were designed in Britain, but they were manufactured in Kaiser's shipyards. Um, they can, they're, they're monsters. They're capable of uh, holding 20 tanks, um, 27 vehicles, and almost 200 men and carrying them all to shore. But these ships are 100 meters long and sturdy enough to transport dozens of heavily armored vehicles. The construction of this new design of ship will be no simple task. The building of LSTs is listed absolute top priority. The shipyard set to work immediately. Orders for materials have already been placed before the design is even completed. And before a test vessel has even been constructed, the blueprints are sent off and the contracts fought over and awarded. The Kaiser shipyards take one of the largest. Lack of planning is useful because it enables the whole productive process to be much more nimble. If you have a rigid plan with fixed targets, rigid designs as to what you're going to produce, how you're going to produce it, then if something unexpected happens, or you find that something you're doing is not working, it's very hard to change course, to suddenly reallocate resources, retool factories. The whole system has a quality of much greater flexibility. April the 1st, 1945. The Americans are ready to launch what could be the decisive battle for the Pacific. The Battle of Okinawa, the largest amphibious assault in the Pacific theater of war. 1,457 landing craft and warships approach the island of Okinawa. The size of the American force landing at Okinawa is astonishing, and the battle lasts almost three months. On August 15th, 1945, Japan surrenders. The history of World War II is often depicted as a story of generals and wartime leaders of competing military strategies. But more than any war before or since, the Second World War was a war of production and it would transform America, leaving it with a role on the world stage it had not wanted. During the attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States has four aircraft carriers. By the end of the war, they have over a hundred. These are extraordinary epochal transformations in the capacity of the United States to act at a, at a world level. By the end of the war, the US Navy was very much larger than the Royal Navy. It's a great world historical transition that takes place. On the morning of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States Navy had 17 battleships, eight aircraft carriers, 112 submarines, and no amphibious vehicles. A total of 790 active naval military vessels. By VJ Day, the Navy had expanded to 23 battleships, 99 aircraft carriers, 232 submarines, and 2,547 amphibious vehicles. A force of staggering size totaling 6,768 active naval military vessels. The US Navy accounted for 70% of the total naval force on the planet. But at the end of the war, the Richmond shipyard shut down. So did Bethlehem Fairfield. They had worked at breakneck speed for four years. They had changed the course of the war and of history, but their task was complete. The American shipbuilding program is symbolic of America's uh, pioneering spirit of industry at the time. 1.7 million Americans worked in shipyards during World War II. Um, today, that figure's dropped off by 95%, to about 100,000. It was truly an impressive uh, operation. We couldn't do it today. We couldn't even manage the paperwork today in the length of time that they, they built ships back then. It was, uh, it was pretty amazing. While the United States Navy today is only a fraction of its size in 1945, 
it remains a dominant force in the world's oceans and seas. The untold story of war production. All wars are about competition in production. The side that can produce more is always going to triumph. This is a war between the factories. The real story of how the world wars were fought and won. It may sound strange, but modern wars, they're not won by battles. They're won by factories. They swamped the other side with a tide of mass production. And those factories would shape the modern world. Volkswagen, Fiat, Mitsubishi, they're all household names now, but they made those names as war factories. Gotta get back to work. In August 1939, a group of scientists composed a letter to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The letter was written by Albert Einstein, the most famous physicist in the world at this time. And he says that due to recent research on uranium, it was possible that you could create a massive amount of power by splitting the atom, and that if you could harness that power, then you could conceivably make a really powerful bomb. Essentially, the fear was that Nazi Germany could build this potentially war-winning weapon, a weapon capable of destroying cities um, and potentially rendering all current armament and military capabilities obsolete. Roosevelt doesn't get around to reading the letter till about October, and when he does, he realizes he has to have the research done. When something matters to Roosevelt, he can act very quickly. And what's fascinating is how quickly he gets the physicists in to talk to him and how soon he starts putting into place an American program. And it was in response to Albert Einstein's letter to the president that the Manhattan Project was born. But the Manhattan Project was just the beginning of an apocalyptic tale about the nuclear war factory that would span the American continent and ultimately threaten the world. On the 19th of January, 1942, just over a month after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt gave his official approval for an accelerated A-bomb project to go ahead. But progress was slow. Getting the idea of an atomic bomb off of paper and into reality is not easy at all. They're trying to make a weapon that doesn't exist. It's not like designing a new aircraft or designing a tank in this case. It's designing a weapon that no one has ever seen before. It exists in sort of physicists' mind. The science took time. It took dozens of the leading brains in the world to really think this through how to be done and overcome many scientific problems that had never been addressed before. The people that are going to have to mastermind it are spread out all over the country at different scientific institutions and getting them all together on the same page to do something by one centralized process is like herding cats. Also, by the way, spreading it out provides some secrecy. In essence, it was the most complex war factory ever put together. We have to get beyond our mind of seeing a factory as some sort of satanic mill of industrial production belching out smoke and producing heavy metal goods. The atom bomb is in many ways the most extraordinary example of a factory production because it's Sources of supply, sources of production, are spread out around the country. President Roosevelt soon realized that he couldn't just leave this to the scientists. So to manage this project through, I mean, it's a massive construction project. You want an establishment that's already there to manage it for you. You don't want to create one. It's a time of war, so you're going to pick between the army and the navy. And for this purpose, the army are the ones with all of the experience in organization on massive construction projects, and they're the one you choose. So in August 1942, President Roosevelt sets in train the Manhattan Engineering District under the command of General Leslie Groves. The organization is generally known as the Manhattan Project. Everybody, including General Leslie Groves, thinks that he is the wrong man for the job. Not only does nobody like him, 
but he wants a battlefield command and he had no interest in what he perceived as a desk job, so it's not where he wants to be at all. But Groves turns out to be an inspired appointment. What he's got is the experience to get it done. He's already overseeing army construction projects and they're worth billions of dollars, so he's a very responsible guy. But not only that, he's a real force of nature. When he's given the job, some comedian tells him at the beginning, yeah, all of the research and development's already done. All you've got to do is take it off a of paper and put it into being, and then you're going to win the war for us. And he pretty much immediately realises this is absolute bull. Because to build the bomb, General Groves needs five things in place. He needs a design for the bomb. He needs a vast source of uranium. He needs a nuclear reactor to put it in. And then he has to replicate that never-done-before reaction on an industrial scale. And then he needs to put it in an aeroplane, which will fly at 3,000 miles and drop it with pinpoint accuracy onto an enemy target. You know, when he takes up the job, he's got none of those things. Groves does have one thing in his favour. The appointment of J. Robert Oppenheimer to oversee the scientists designing the bomb though at first glance, he might not have seen it that way. The relationship between the two is uneasy at times. They do clash, but they actually are productive in terms of war. Now, what brings them together, I think, is that they're worried about Germany. The idea of Nazi Germany, Adolf Hitler, developing an atom bomb is so terrifying to these physicists that they're willing to accept the kind of military authority needed to put the whole operation into, into being. Once he was established in the secret research facility at Los Alamos, New Mexico, Oppenheimer and his team started working on two different types of bomb. The first one is nicknamed Thin Man after FDR. A bomb casing that had a machine gun barrel in it that fired a plutonium projectile down the length of that barrel. It creates a critical mass, which creates a chain reaction, which releases lots and lots of energy, which is where you get the bang. The second bomb is nicknamed Fat Man after Churchill. In this case, putting, for example, a subcritical piece of plutonium in the middle of a spherical bomb design surrounded by electronic charges and detonations. That's why it's more of a circular detonation device, is you would send pressure in on the atoms from all sides by exploding inwards. And that pressure would cause it to fuse and release the energy. But it won't matter what they do if Groves can't get the fissile material they need to put into the bombs. So he sources over one million kilograms of high-quality uranium from the Belgian Congo. Having sourced a supply of fuel, the next step was finding a way to turn it into fissionable material, capable of generating a nuclear explosion. The man entrusted with this task was Enrico Fermi at the University of Chicago who's a complete nutcase because he sets up his operation in a squash court next to a football field. And at this point, there's no guarantee that when he sets off a reaction, he isn't gonna blanket Chicago in radiation. So rather than fill in any health and safety forms or do any risk assessments, he just doesn't tell anyone that he's about to do it and he tests it anyway. And luckily for him, it works without destroying Chicago. But creating a nuclear reaction was only the first step. Now Groves had to turn that process into a factory. Groves had already picked the site for his nuclear factory, um, so much so that the day after he bought his uranium, he signed up to have three factories in Oak Ridge in Tennessee. And they're all located in valleys, you know, well away from the town. Uh, and that, of course, provides security and containment in case of, well, frankly, explosions. But Groves knew that just building a nuclear factory wasn't enough. He needed a working company infrastructure with experience in this kind of project to run it. He found it in DuPont. This is a huge chemical manufacturer with an impeccable safety record. And their track record went all the way back to the reign of Louis XVI in France, where to make them focus on safety, that the guys running it would have to build their houses within range of any explosions or anything that went wrong, so that they would put an emphasis on safety and, and no risk. And they're still holding to that by the time World War II comes around. <laughs> 
So DuPont was the perfect choice to run a brand new weapons factory, making the most dangerous material on Earth. Only problem was, DuPont didn't agree. DuPont, however, don't want anything to do with the project. For a start, they produce 40% of all of the explosives used by the Allies in World War I. They made so much money. They were branded as profiteers, and they don't want to be branded with that again. And so what you've got, you've got this sort of last-ditch effort from General Groves, and he tells the company that the atom bomb project is the president's top priority and that could actually win the war. And so, you know, with the president behind it, this is becoming more of a question of a patriotic duty to do it rather than something that's going to enhance the bottom line. So DuPont actually agrees, but they want to still avoid these accusations of war profiteering. And so what DuPont insists is that its fee for the project would only be one dollar. DuPont immediately recognised that Oak Ridge wasn't going to be large enough to produce fissile materials in the quantities they needed. So they began building another facility at Hanford in Washington state. Between them, these two plants would employ almost 100,000 people, building and managing the nuclear reactors capable of handling more than 2,000 tubes of uranium. It was a massive project. The magnets in the reactors needed so much copper that eventually they robbed the US Treasury of uh, 15,000 tonnes of silver as a substitute in order to make the coils for the reactors. By June 1944, Groves had a functioning factory working to create the world's first atomic bomb. That activity centred around Oak Ridge, Tennessee, Alamogordo, New Mexico, Los Alamos, New Mexico, and Hanford, Washington. They fit together in many ways extremely well, but they just have huge vast distances between them. It is not what we traditionally think of as a factory, but it works on the process of sort of large people doing tasks. But war waits for no man. And while Groves is getting his factories up and running, the doomsday clock keeps ticking. September 1944, the Allies have landed at Normandy on D-Day and the Germans are on the run. It is now obvious that the A-bomb will be targeted at Japan and Groves wants it ready by August 1945. To do that, he wants to turn uranium into plutonium. But when DuPont activates the Hanford reactor, it doesn't work. So there's this key moment when Dupont switches on the reactor pile at Hanford, and that's just after midnight on the 27th of September, 1944. And the whole thing runs absolutely perfectly for about three hours. And at 3 a.m., the power level mysteriously just begins to plummet. And it basically stopped working less than 24 hours later, at which point it then started working again, got to the same level as the day before, and again plummeted and stopped working, which was utterly baffling. So, you know, something really weird is going on. It turned out what was happening was a process called xenon poisoning. What's happened is that when the reactor fires up, it floods the system with a byproduct called xenon. Which would then cause the reactor to shut down at which point the xenon would then decay and the reactor would be fine again and then it would start working and then the same process would continue to happen. Luckily, despite the objection of some scientists who are thinking that the whole thing is incredibly overcautious, DuPont have installed a large number of extra tubes into the system. This design feature is essential because it means that the pile can be expanded to reach a power level high enough to overwhelm the xenon poisoning. So actually, DuPont safety protocols, you know, rooted in decades, if not centuries, have actually saved the day. As the deadline races towards them, the team at Los Alamos gets a working bomb in place. By mid-July, by some miracle, they've got a test device called Gadget ready to go. The automatic control's got it now. In 40 seconds, we'll know. But no one was prepared for the magnitude of what they were about to witness when Gadget was set off at the Trinity test on the 16th of July, 1945. 
you've got one of the leaders of the Manhattan Project, and he recalls seeing this this burst of blinding white light, you know, which, which burns his retinas and just leaves him completely stunned, as, as you can well imagine. And, and this light just seems to go on forever. And years later, he admits that for a split second, he, he really believed that something had gone horribly wrong and that they had set fire to the entire atmosphere and, and that the world was just going to, you know, disappear effectively. There must have been, and indeed I'm sure there was, and many of the scientists a feeling of, what have we done? The bomb was now no longer a theory. It would become very real three weeks later. On 6th of August 1945, the Enola Gay leaves Tinian Air Force Base in the Pacific on its way to mainland Japan. It flew to its primary target, the city of Hiroshima, the southern part of the island of Honshu. The people of Hiroshima, to this point, had actually felt themselves lucky. In fact, they had been surprised how little Hiroshima had been attacked compared to other Japanese cities. What they didn't understand is that they had deliberately not been targeted to make them one of the possible targets for the atom bomb. The bomb explodes above the city. By doing this, it, it maximizes the blast as opposed to dropping the bomb and making it explode on the ground. It's almost like a little sun being released. It's estimated that as many as 80,000 people may have been killed by the immediate blast of the weapon itself. You go from a big Japanese city going to work to basically a moonscape in a heartbeat. Three days after Hiroshima, the Americans drop the Fat Man device on Nagasaki. Within nine days, Japan had surrendered. There continues to be a, a significant debate about the wisdom, efficacy, need, morality of dropping the atomic bombs in 1945. Of course, no one should have sat there and thought it was OK to kill 100,000 people. It's actually really a difficult question. What I'm more perplexed about is why people be so sure that they know whether these things should or should not have been dropped. But there may have been another equally pressing reason to demonstrate the power now in America's hands. This is because the Cold War's already started. Soviet forces outnumber the Western allies, and there is no way, if Stalin decides that he's going to invade Europe, that any conventional force could stop him. So the Americans adopt a, a policy of nuclear deterrence, essentially where they sit there and wave a nuclear bomb in Stalin's face and say, well, do it if you want, but this is what's waiting for you. So you could make the case, certainly, that the dropping of the atomic bomb was as much about essentially saying, you may have lots of troops, if you push on, this is how we're going to respond. To hammer home the point, the Americans staged a grand demonstration at Bikini Atoll in the Pacific. In 1946, the United States conducted Operation Crossroads. And this, I think, again, was about sending a very strong signal about what atomic weapons could do in warfare. Essentially, what happened here, two devices were detonated. Five, four, three, two, one, fire. They blew up an entire empty fleet, spewed thousands of tons of water into the air, and created a, a blast that was equal to 21,000 tons of TNT. So what they were saying is, do it if you want to mess with us, but just be prepared. This is what's going to happen to your army, your navy, if you mess with us from now on. But it was all a bluff. In September 45, so actually after the war, General Groves is told to prepare enough atom bombs to drop onto 66 Soviet sites. And then he also needs to have three nuclear weapons per target. But you've got to realise there was one little problem with the plan. At the time, America owned precisely six bombs. In the post-war world, it soon became clear that the Manhattan district simply could not meet America's nuclear demand. So they replaced it with the US Atomic Energy Commission. This would become the main steering body and overseeing body of the US nuclear industry. 
What shifted the American nuclear program into another gear was the speed of the Soviet response to the atom bomb. Much to the surprise of the United States and many in the West, the Soviet Union tested its first nuclear device in 1949, just four years um, after the first use by the United States. The nuclear arms race had begun. Twenty-ninth of August, 1949, the Soviet Union tests its first atomic bomb, codenamed Joe One by the Americans, only four years after Hiroshima. Now, this really shouldn't surprise us because the Soviets have this incredibly vast, well-established spy network, and that's sending back nuclear secrets from the United States. The Soviets, after all, had spies at the Manhattan Project. And so Stalin knew about the plan to develop a US bomb before Truman did, in fact. Crazily enough, there were, in fact, three brothers who were all spies reporting to the Soviets who had, perhaps, people think, provided the blueprint for the atomic bomb to the Soviets. So the key thing that the Americans thought they lacked was nuclear fuel, but what they didn't know was that the Soviets had had a windfall. Because at the end of the war, they find tons of fissile material that had been developed for the German abortive atomic weapons development program. The reason that the Nazis don't have an atomic bomb is because they're the Nazis. Instead of pooling all of their resources together, they decide to have multiple teams competing to make an atomic bomb. They would need like a thousand cubes of uranium to be able to reach critical mass. One team had just over 600 and the other had 400, but instead of being sensible and working together and achieving it, they basically squandered it all in competition with each other. So it's just, it's just Hitler and the Nazis all over. And the Soviets got their hands on massive amounts of German uranium. And so they shipped that to the Soviet Union, and that provides the uranium for the first Soviet reactors. One year later, in June 1950, communist-backed North Korea attacked American-backed South Korea and started the Korean War. They took the North Korean communist attack on the South, starting the Korean War, to really show the Americans that this threat from communism was a military threat. Because it seems to vindicate the idea that communism is an expansionist ideology, democracy is on the back foot globally. There is a push from communism, whether it be in China, whether it be in Europe, that this is something global that the United States and the West, and of course formation of NATO in 1949, um, has to push back. So a US military response was going to be necessary. And the military industrial complex with the factories producing weapons, uh, both conventional and nuclear, were going to have to shift more into high gear. And the 1950s was about to elevate the nuclear arms race to a whole new level. Because on the 1st of November, 1952, the USA detonates the world's first ever thermonuclear device at Eniwetok Atoll in the South Pacific. The Ivy Mike shot in 1952 represented another sea change in nuclear weaponry. While this was still technically an atomic bomb, it relied on a very different mechanism um, to release its power. The basic concept is that you have a small nuclear explosion, um, but in a bomb that contains a whole load of hydrogen as well, and that by the time one reacts with the other, it creates a super explosion. Ivy Mike would be the first test and would begin the generation of bombs that would be measured in the megatons, that's millions of tons of TNT. Three years later, the Soviets joined the thermonuclear club. In November 55, the Soviets test their first true thermonuclear weapon. Now, there's almost now no limit to the size of an explosion that either superpower can now create. When you get to the hydrogen bomb, you are now talking about planetary extinction. You are now getting to the point where you have, if you have enough of these weapons, 
and you can blanket you know, the Soviet Union or the United States, you're not only destroying those countries, you're probably destroying the world. To blanket these countries with nukes, you need to build them in industrial quantities. Remarkably, that mainly took place in just two sites, the Burlington and Pantex plants. And only one of those is still in operation today. While the US nuclear enterprise is spread across the country and involves lots of different people and companies, the actual bombs are the responsibility of just one place in Amarillo, Texas. That's the Pantex facility. Today, Pantex concentrates on decommissioning and upgrading America's current nuclear arsenal. But in 1975, it became the sole source of nuclear weaponry in the USA. It's the, this one plant where nuclear warheads were assembled during the nuclear arms race. It's initially simply a World War II munitions base, so all pretty conventional. But in 1951, it becomes something else entirely, because it's then when it's quietly refurbished to serve its new Cold War role. The facility had a number of reinforced bunkers, shielded bunkers, which is where they would actually fuse the nuclear material to the warhead or the weapon itself. Inside these bunkers, you have 3,000-odd ex-farmers and, and people who would have done normal jobs around Amarillo in Texas who have been brought into a nuclear industry walking around in suits with gloves on, assembling these parts for use in the nuclear arms race. They were then moved to different parts of the facility where other components would be attached, firing mechanisms, actual bomb casings, and in some cases, the directional fins that are used to sort of guide the weapon. If you really think about it, Pantex was actually the heart of the nuclear industrial weapons complex in the United States. But to get nukes into and out of Pantex, you need a transport system. Coming in and out of Pantex, you have these really innocuous looking white trains. Every day, these trains, they, they roll into Pantex and they carry plutonium from Georgia and Washington and bomb triggers from Colorado and uranium from Tennessee. And they all roll out again, carrying these fully assembled nukes all over the country. The white trains remained in operation until public protests made them untenable during the 1980s. Now, in the 1980s, there was a lot of pushback and a lot of public protest against what was going on at the Pantex facility. Protesters would actually line up and wait for the white trains to leave the facility with their nuclear weapons cargo and try and disrupt them with some publicity stunt. And you've got this one occasion in which you've got a nun who actually stands in the middle of the tracks and she comes really close to being run over. So they come up with this ingenious ploy to paint the trains a different colour. Unfortunately, I don't think it matters which colour you paint the train because if it comes out with whopping great big sniper turrets on every other carriage, then you're pretty safe to assume that there's nuclear material on board. <laughs> The protesters feared the inherent danger that lurked at the heart of the nuclear industry, the threat of nuclear devastation. Now, there's this study carried out by the Americans, and what that aims to do is to consider how many thermonuclear weapons might be needed. And after a lot of maths, it finds that after about 400 or so detonations, there would be nothing left worth attacking. Further detonations would simply make the rubble bounce. And yet, by 1985, America has more than 20,000 nuclear warheads, and the Soviet Union has over 38,000. Going into the area of mutually assured destruction, where the idea of a nuclear exchange is not anything that will be a limited war or a short-term war, it'll be an exterminatory war. Because the principle is, if you launch yours, they will know about it quickly enough to launch all of theirs, which means that if one side launches and the other retaliates, you all die. So basically, it's a game of chicken. So this was the sort of the insane, um, threatening environment of the Cold War. I mean, it's called mad by his detractors, and it is mad, but it's also brutally simple. 
Essentially, they have these massive arsenals of nuclear weapons and they're just going to sit and stare each other out. As the world stared oblivion in the face, governments began to plan for the worst. The United Kingdom solution can be found behind a nondescript door at the foot of a radio mast in the middle of a muddy field in Essex. Locals were told that this was a water reservoir. But here, buried more than 30 metres underground, at the end of a 110 metre long tunnel, lies the remains of a top secret facility with which the British government hoped to counter the madness. You're now inside the Kelvedon Hatch secret nuclear bunker, the would-be home of some of central government in the event of a nuclear attack. You're 100 foot underground, you've come into the hill by a 120 yards long tunnel, and it's from here that the inhabitants would allocate surviving resources to those of us that had survived. The people down here have been sent here, obviously, to help us survive after a nuclear attack. And so this is the plotting floor. This is a map of the region around London. These are the cold perspex plans that would have told us where bombs had gone off. On it also are the little Royal Observer Corps bunkers, uh, and they're the ones that are going to pick up the size of the, the bomb from the flash and the distance and the radiation and the wind and feed all that technical information into this bunker here. The red bursts there are ground bursts. They're the worst. The ground burst picks up all the dirt into the atmosphere and that's what carries the radiation and so that is spreading with the wind. They mark the direction of the wind there, the size of the, uh, the bomb, and then they would be trying to evacuate us from in front of the radiation if that was indeed possible. The general public don't have access to this. This is home office and so this is civil servants. This is people who are going to be able to make decisions on our behalf. Of course, we're underneath our kitchen tables, uh, hiding away in our, uh, uh, under our stairs. Places like Kelverdon Hatch were designed for the worst case scenario, if the threat of mutually assured destruction had failed to prevent an attack. But as the nuclear age hurtled towards the 21st century, the fatal flaws at the heart of the nuclear factory started to become all too apparent. Nestled in the heart of the Ural Mountains is the hidden city of Azjursk. And behind its kind of guarded gates and its barbed wire fences, there is this absolutely beautiful landscape city. And it's, it's like a kind of oasis. And if you go to the northeast of the city, you've got this government-protected East Ural Nature Reserve. And it looks like an idyllic place to go and live within the Soviet Union. But behind the idyll, lurks a deadly secret. Both the US and the Soviet Union had top secret facilities where they were manufacturing nuclear weapons. But in the Soviet Union, these were called secret cities. They brought scientists and their families there. They are disappeared in that very Stalinist way from the records. They were not allowed to have contact with anyone in the outside world, not even their families. As far as their families were concerned, they were missing. Because what happens there is that every citizen works in some way, shape or form for the Mayak nuclear factory. Until the 29th of September 1957, that is. In September 1957, there was an issue at Mayak with the cooling system on a waste storage tank. There had been indications for a year that there was a problem with the cooling system, but they didn't do anything about it. And suddenly it blew up, sending this radioactive plume of smoke across uh, what I've seen estimates as high as 20,000 square miles. What did the Soviets do? Of course, they didn't announce this. Instead of actually acknowledging what's happened, you know, there's a cover-up. And what the Soviet government does, it just conveniently turns the disaster zone into the East Ural Nature Reserve, and it prohibits any unauthorised access. 
There are still high levels of radiation there in this part of Russia today. In fact, one of the lakes is called the Lake of Death because the radiation levels are so high, higher even than the Chernobyl disaster registered in 1986. Even today in Azursk, um, residents have to check their fruit and vegetables with a Geiger counter to make sure it's safe to eat it. The Kishtim accident, as it is called, because Ozyersk was not supposed to exist, is just one example of what can happen when nuclear power goes wrong. Now, of course, Kishtim isn't the only nuclear disaster we all know of. Better known examples like Fukushima, Three Mile Island, and of course, the big one, Chernobyl. But actually, Kishtim, you know, it's forgotten, but it's the third most serious nuclear disaster recorded in history. And I just find that extraordinary because, you know, what it does is it demonstrates a key danger of nuclear power. Because when it goes wrong, of course, it can go spectacularly wrong. The same can be said of mutually assured destruction. While it's impossible to prove a negative, it is likely that the advent of nuclear weapons has had a significant role on preventing major interstate war. You've got to remember that the 20th century you know, was the most violent and brutal century in human history. But, you know, for half a century, no major global power has declared war on another major global power. Had it been uh, a, a different time, you know, pre-1945, maybe there would have been a war at some point, of some kind of direct American-Soviet confrontation. So in that sense, it does keep the direct peace. But MAD only works if both sides have something to lose. The concept of mutually assured destruction relies on rational people facing off against each other and realising the consequences of what will happen if they unleash this stuff on each other. Unfortunately, the people that are in charge of things aren't always rational. MAD worked, we now know, during the Cold War. Neither side dared to launch nuclear weapons against the other. What the situation is now with countries like North Korea or Iran, countries building the bomb or who have the bomb, will they also be deterred from using it? Perhaps even more worrying is the idea that MAD may not always work. MAD isn't a doctrine, it is a condition, and it is based on some things that are uncontrollable and can go wrong. One amazing story, usually used as an example of the dangers inherent in the system of mutually assured destruction, may actually provide a ray of hope through the gloom. So it's the 26th of September 1983. You've got this man called Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov, and he works for the Soviet Air Defense, and he's the duty officer at the command center in this place called the Oko Nuclear Early Warning System. He's sitting there doing his job, and all of a sudden, the system lights up and tells him that a nuclear weapon has just been launched from America. And he thinks, oh, God, no. <laughs> So he's looking at this and the computer then tells him that another four have been launched as well. This is the moment he'd been trained for. And he sat there thinking this, this can't be happening. He picked up the phone because of course he was supposed to call his superiors, but he kept holding the phone in his hand thinking, if I tell them, they're gonna definitely push the button to respond. Because, of course, you know, under the doctrine of mutually assured destruction, if you detect your enemy attacking you, you attack him back straight away, and then you just wipe each other out. So he kept watching. He said later he just had this gut instinct that it wasn't really an incoming strike. Because he thought to himself, five missiles? This isn't the way the US is going to launch a major strike on the Soviet Union. You're going to use a lot more than five missiles. So he sat there for five minutes with the phone in one hand, his intercom to announce to his colleagues in the other hand, just watching. And you know what? Well, that's why we're sitting here today while we're watching. He's proved right. It was a full salon. And it was caused by these really unusual atmospheric conditions. It later turned out 
that what caused those images on his radar system was the way the sun had been shining on the top of a cloud. It just appeared that way on his system, where it might be missiles, but they weren't. So on the one hand, you can say that we came this close to Armageddon um, in the shape of a computer glitch. Or you can say that at that point, there was a rational, sensible human being who said, no way. And he waited and it didn't happen. Yeah, for my money, the story of Petrov uh, tells you that actually human beings, especially if they're well trained, you know, do react rationally. And also, you know, when it comes to being faced with the prospect of destroying the planet, you, you tend to think twice. It may be a fragile hope to rely on, but as the factories of the military industrial complex churn out enough missiles to destroy the world more than 50 times over, what may protect us from oblivion is the sheer madness of their existence. We don't know whether people would have pulled the trigger quite as, as easily as we would think. And is that basic human instinct or is that the power of mutually assured destruction where no one wants to actually cross that line? I don't know. The human element in all of this is so strong. Is there always going to be that rational, sensible human being there to stop it? I hope so. I think in most cases you would hope so, but are we not walking a really fine line now? Um, because what if they're not? There is no doubt that the bombs produced by the Manhattan District's war factories have fundamentally changed the world. It's very hard to stop technology. I think maybe that's what the Second World War shows that once you have a technology out there, it can spread, and it's very hard to, to roll back on the technology. Arguably, the use of nuclear weapons in 1945 helped create a taboo whereby the use of nuclear weapons was seen as something that was unimaginable. I suppose the good news is that they've only been used in one conflict, and you know, on only two occasions. But, you know, those two examples have shown us just how horrific they are. And of course, it's made us all collectively terrified of using them ever since. So we can only hope that it's going to stay that way. This is the story of two guns. One would revolutionize the way we make things, the other would revolutionize revolution. But behind their success lay a very simple concept. They were incredibly reliable. You could use them just about anywhere. They would keep firing, whether it was in the desert of the American West, the jungles of Vietnam, the mud of Northern France. The weapons just worked. You've got to be absolutely damn sure that if it does break down, you can fix it yourself right on the spot. And that's what these guns do. Colt and Kalashnikov, two iconic names that conjure images of showdowns and revolution. But behind their success lay factories. When you think of Colt, you think of the Wild West, but you shouldn't. You should think of assembly lines, factories, and mass production. From the Cold War struggle in Berlin to far-flung places such as Vietnam, the Kalashnikov was used by all. Because these guns wouldn't just change the nature of warfare, they would change the world. Sometime in 1830, on board a brig bound for Calcutta, a young man called Samuel Colt had an idea. The story goes that Colt was just 16, and he's persuaded his father to let him go to sea, to study navigation firsthand. And it was there that as he was watching the other sailors use something called a capstan, which is essentially a rotating device to pull in sails, he was struck by the way that the revolving mechanism had a lock which stopped it from winding in reverse. Colt recalls that he had his great insight. 
What if he could use that same rotational mechanism for a revolver, for a new kind of gun that would revolutionize repeating weapons and maybe make him a large amount of money? So every moment of his spare time on that voyage, he sits down and he whittles a model prototype out of wood. And so the revolver was born. But the truth behind the myth is very different. That's the romantic version. The historical reality is that various other inventors had actually beaten Colt to at least some of his ideas. Importantly, the revolving pistol. And this example, made by a guy called Annerley, 150 years before Colt got things going, is actually an eight-shot revolver. So if you're looking for firepower, it's even more firepower than a Colt. You simply cock the gun and the cylinder revolves. It's just like a Colt revolver in that respect. So Colt was definitely not the inventor of the revolver. His genius lay in borrowing existing technologies and combining them together, but just as critically with him was his marketing genius. You have to remember that Colt was a salesman and he was as, as interested in telling a story about his product as he was in selling you the product. He wanted a narrative, he wanted an origin story. And, and so he wove this great moment of insight while he was at sea as a teenager. The Annerley revolver was not very reliable, which is why we've hardly ever heard of it. But the problem it was trying to solve was one which had bedeviled firearms since their invention. At the beginning of the 19th century, this is what you're armed with as a cavalryman. You only get one shot. To make up for that, he's got two. Draw one, fire one, draw two, fire number two. But that's really it. And that leaves you pretty much thrown back in time to the medieval period. Not much different than a medieval knight, uh, different shape of blade, but nonetheless, it's a sword. If you could invent a weapon that fired quickly, that fired multiple shots uh, much faster than the others, you would have not only a great advantage on the battlefield, but if you were trying to sell it, you would have an enormous advantage in the business world. Colt had the idea for the weapon, but he needed money to get his new invention off the ground. The story of how he went about getting that money is almost crazier than the actual story of the weapon itself. The thing we all got to know about entrepreneurs is that they don't let anything get in their way, or at least no decent entrepreneur. And you know, these are the kind of people, you know, they don't, they don't just make lemonade out of lemons. What they do is they invent a lemon press <laughs> and then they figure out how to bottle the stuff so they can sell it to people by the million. Um, and if they don't have the money to do that, then they come up with a creative way of making money. What Samuel Cole did in an incredibly entrepreneurial fashion was he started touring the country and he sold people hits of laughing gas. And then what he does with all the profits he makes from his roadshow, he sinks them into hiring a gunsmith to build his prototype. And he uses that to take out a patent for what's called the Colt Patterson Revolver. On the 5th of March, Colt's Patent Arms Manufacturing Company was born, and Colt built a factory at Patterson, New Jersey. But it didn't go well. Colt turned out to be better at the road show than he was actually at the production of the revolver. You're trying to sell a whole load of new stuff, new ideas to your client, and it was just too much um, for the US government, especially the US military, who actually would have to issue these things. At one point, the US Army actually said that the revolver was too innovative and thus it would be dangerous to buy. He's managed to sell a few firearms during the Seminole Indian Wars in the late 1830s, but it's not enough to keep him afloat. And in 1842, he goes bankrupt. But those few firearms would eventually make Samuel Colt's fortune. Sometime in 1846, Colt had a meeting with a US cavalryman called Samuel Walker, which would change his destiny. Walker believed that Colt's revolver had actually saved his life. His units attacked by um, 70 Comanche Indians. His men are able to fend them off because they can fire so many shots so quickly. The fact that the Colt patent revolver could fire five shots without reloading saved them from being overrun and killed. Had they had the single-shot pistols, it would have been two shots and done. Walker suggested a few improvements 
which would transform Colt's gun. We have two pistols here. This is the original Colt, the so-called Colt Patterson. It's a very technically sound design. Uh, it's rather small, as is very obvious. So when Colt comes back, he comes back big, what's called the Colt Dragoon, which is what we have here. Right away, you can see the difference. Very small, very large. And it's not just about looks. Um, the size really does matter here. Bigger size means bigger caliber, a bigger bullet. It's gonna do more damage. A much bigger cylinder means a much bigger charge of gunpowder behind it. Faster bullet, harder hitting bullet. That's critical. The larger cylinder also means you can fit in one more shot, because five shots is good, six shots is even better. Times two, two pistols, gives you 12. Uh, really quite a leap forward. So for the time, this is the ultimate cavalry weapon. Thanks to this new design, the US government ordered 1,000 Colt Walker revolvers. Colt was able to raise the money to build a brand new factory in his hometown of Hartford, Connecticut. But this wasn't just any old weapons factory. This was something the world had never seen before. Now, it's often said that actually the first ever mass-produced object was the gun. Now, there's some people who say that it really might have been the clock, uh, but the one that we know that was perfected was the gun. And the man at the forefront of this? None other than Colt. Because actually what he did was to hire an organisational genius called Alicia K. Root to run his factory. And what they created was essentially the world's first assembly line. Colt's factory was 500 feet long and 60 feet wide, and it was filled with a variety of machines to build each part of the revolver. So you had different areas of the factory floor doing different tasks, and then the gun would effectively come together down a production line, just like a modern factory. 80% of the work was done there in the Hartford plant on these enormous machines that are driven by steam. There were machines that bored out holes in the cylinders for the bullets. Then you had machines that bored the barrels. And then you had machines that fashioned the whole firing mechanism. There were machines for every part of the revolver. All of these individual parts being put together by this enormous workforce. To assemble the gun that Colt had imagined. What that does is streamline manufacturing to the extent that parts can come from all over a workshop floor and they simply descend on one person who assembles the final firearm at the end with parts that are interchangeable from everything that was made inside that factory. Colt's factory was one of the first sort of war munition factories in existence. It's not just that the revolver was innovative, it's that the factory itself was a new thing. What we're looking at here is a classic assembly line. You know, we think assembly line, Henry Ford, Model T cars. I mean, this is way before that. Colt was doing it decades before in Hartford. Colt's Hartford assembly line churned out 150 guns a day. Cheap, fast firing and dependable, their reputation for reliability was built on one very simple concept. Before Colt, if you have a gun and part of it breaks, you have to go to a gunsmith who will make a part that will work purely and only for your gun. If you take it out, it won't work in another gun, even if it's the same broad kind of gun. By contrast with Colt, what you find is that if you take the rotating barrel out of one Colt and put it into another Colt, it will work perfectly well. The part is identical. This may seem easy and obvious, but it took genius to produce. The challenge is that uh, producing the machinery that will produce the interchangeable parts in the first place is technically very demanding. Just to put it in perspective, during the 20th century, long after the Industrial Revolution, when assembly line production techniques are in full use, there are times where multiple manufacturers are producing one firearm and parts won't interchange. But the truth behind the sales pitch is very different. Because what I'm holding in my hands is a reproduction. 
a modern replica of the 1851 Navy revolver made on modern machine tools to modern standards. So it interchanges without a problem. Let's just try that out with original 1851 navies. So disassemble the gun we want to place the part on. Moment of truth, it doesn't go. Not only does it not engage and turn and cock, it doesn't even fit the frame. So if you were to show this to one of Colt's prospective customers, they wouldn't be very impressed. You know what? It's all marketing. Because what Colt is, is a supreme self-publicist. His genius lies in convincing people that he could achieve the impossible before it had even been done. To achieve that, he's basically got to cheat. He's got to pre-select guns that already fit together quite well, maybe even get a gunsmith to hand file them all so they fit each other. They rigged it, essentially, so that it would look like the parts were interchangeable when they really weren't. This sort of faking of, of interchangeability is a really strong sign of how Colt was as much a salesman as he was an inventor. So in that way, he was kind of like the Steve Jobs of his day, selling this whole idea of the technological revolution long before he had actually achieved it. And he convinced people to pay him to make it a reality. Once it was a reality, Colt was quick to protect his investment. Samuel Colt is a great entrepreneur, but he's also one of the world's first and most prominent patent trolls. Uh, he patents his innovations as, almost as soon as he makes them, and he then spends an amazing amount of time throughout his business career suing people who have violated his patents. The very name of the Colt company to this day is Colt's Patent Firearms Manufacturing Company. Um, and they don't just maintain that because it sounds old world and, and fun. In the early 19th century, when everyone is inventing all of the technology we now take for granted, it's absolutely essential to not only file patents for your novel designs, but also to have a team of lawyers going after you if you so much as look like you're infringing on his patents. But what would really make Colt's fortune was the world's first truly modern war. On the 12th of April, 1861, artillery attached to the South Carolina militia opened fire on Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, firing the first shots of the American Civil War. it would prove to be the making of Colt. The American Civil War is in some ways the world's first great industrial war, because ultimately it's won by the sheer industrial might of the Union producing more men, materiel and guns than the Southern Confederacy. And many of those guns were provided by Samuel Colt. And not only do you need a hundred of these, a thousand of these, you need tens of thousands of these weapons. And this is an enormous opportunity for Colt. You have a guaranteed source of, of demand by the US government. You can then plan on producing mass amounts for numbers of years. By this point, Colt was so wealthy that he had created his own workers' city around the Hartford factory, Coltsville. Coltsville, in many ways, was like the Google or Apple campus is today. What it was was a kind of self-contained city within the bigger city of Hartford. And it's got its own ferry boat, it's got its own shops, railway depots, school, recreational facilities. It was this giant open area of land with sculpted terrain that had wildlife like deer and peacocks. It's even got its own church and a social hall for dances and lectures. Now, and this is a big place, it can seat a thousand people. Colt was a man of ideas and those ideas fizzed and sprawled all over the place. He would spend the money to make his workers happy and fulfill his dreams. All of this was designed to attract skilled workers to his factory complex. They worked to a strictly regimented regime. Colt worked his men hard, and he wanted to make sure that they understood they were going to have to work hard. There was a sign over the door to his factory that said, Every man employed in my armory is expected to work 10 hours during the running of the engine, and no one who does not cheerfully consent to do this can be expected to be employed by me. 
Colt is working these people hard. But Colt was also interested in making sure his workers could sustain their efforts. He didn't want them to just work one day and succeed. He wanted them to be able to work day after day after day. He wanted 150 guns to come out of his factory every day. And the way to do that was to make sure that his workers had the support that he needed. He was one of the first people to create the hour lunchtime for his workers. And in a number of other ways, he made sure that they not only worked hard, but were supported in that work. During the American Civil War, almost 1,000 employees produced up to 27,000 muskets and pistols a year. By 1863, the company had sold 300,000 copies of the Colt Army Revolver alone. Samuel Colt was an integral part of the Union defeating the Confederacy in the American Civil War. And the Confederacy knew it. On the morning of the 5th of February, 1864, the armory was destroyed by fire. The fire is believed to have been the work of Confederate arsonists. And all that remains of the original armory today is simply the forging shop with dozens of these uh, great big coal furnaces where steel and iron were cast into all the, all the different pieces that made up the guns. You know, pretty hard to burn down a coal furnace. But Samuel Colt did not live to see his beloved factory burn down. And the person who turned his weapons into a truly household name was not a man called Samuel. It was a woman called Elizabeth. Colt actually died in 1862 of complications of gout. He was only 47 years old. His wife Elizabeth took over the company from him, and amazingly, she was probably a better and more effective leader of Colt firearms than he was. Because she's living in an age where she can't vote, um, but what she manages to do is to kind of take the reins of this company all the way through to 1901. And she becomes one of the most prominent female industrialists the United States has ever seen. The most famous guns that Colt ever made came not under Samuel Colt, but under Elizabeth Colt. And it seems like Colt didn't really hit its stride until after Samuel was dead. Most of us have heard, I think, of a Colt 45. Uh, it's one of those iconic names in the firearms world. 45 refers to caliber of the barrel, chosen by the US military as big enough to reliably put down a man. It was a, what's called a single action revolver, uh, which means, as we've all seen in the Western movies, you had to cock the hammer back before you then pulled the trigger. The Americans, the cowboys, the gunfighters, anyone that needed a gun grew to love this design and the simplicity of the single action trigger. This is really Colt's legacy, and it soon attracts the marketing name of the Peacemaker, then gets described as the gun that won the West. Most people know what you're talking about when you say Colt 45. Elizabeth Colt turned the Colt 45 into an American icon, and she was helped by the unique nature of the American dream. The fact that Colt's product is a firearm uh, is important for success in the American context for two reasons. The first is the existence of, of course, the frontier, where a firearm is a necessity. The other reason, of course, is the uh, veneration of the right to bear arms as being written into the US Constitution. The fact that civilian ownership of firearms is written into the American Constitution ensures that people will be armed as they move out into the frontier, as they move into the West. And they are more often than not armed with a Colt firearm. The United States is a continental-sized country. Now, what this means is that in an area the size of Europe, there are no internal barriers. So if you have a product which catches on, it's going to sell to this enormous geographical area. Colt democratized the ownership of commercially produced firearms for a general shooting public. He not only made the guns that armed the Army and the Navy and the Marine Corps, he armed the guns that were carried by frontiersmen as they went west. These are guns carried by these really iconic figures of the Wild West. You know, Wyatt Earp, Jesse James, Wild Bill Hickok, and they're all their you know, firearms came from these factories at Coltsville. Colt's advertising even ran, God created man, Colt 
made them equal. And as World War loomed at the start of the 20th century, two names synonymous with the evolution of firearms would get drawn into the story of Colt. One would make the Colt 45 the most famous handgun in the world. The other would give its name to the machine gun. To win a war, it's often said you need boots on the ground. And it doesn't matter how many tanks, how many planes, how many ships you've got, if those poor bloody infantry grunts don't take that hell and hold it for you, you can't control the territory you need and you don't get the resources that you need for victory. The most basic part of an army is the individual soldier with their individual weapon occupying their individual part of ground. You can't fight war without the soldiers, and soldiers can't fight without their weapons. The kinds of guns that Colt was building was absolutely necessary to the wars that the United States fought in the 19th and the 20th century. General George Patton was famous for carrying an 1873 Colt Peacemaker in a holster on his hip whilst leading his tanks. But he wasn't the only US soldier carrying a Colt 45. So for many people, this is still the iconic Colt 45 from all of those Westerns. But there's another equally important Colt 45, and this is it. Designed in 1910, 1911 by a genius gun designer called John Moses Browning. It's actually the government model of 1911, designed for the military, still 45 caliber, still had that great big bullet coming out the end, but a completely different design. It was incredibly reliable, often firing thousands of rounds between malfunctions. And unlike the revolvers that the Army had used, it was actually a semi-automatic, which meant that once you fired a bullet, it automatically reloaded the next one and was ready to go. It was exactly the weapon that the Army needed. It's so reliable, it's still in use during the Korean and Vietnam Wars decades later. And people absolutely love it. I mean, even soldiers and civilians. And you can see this iconic gun in unit photos from the First World War. You know, these are men who once would have been posing with swords or rifles. And they've now got, you know, posing proudly with their Colt M1911s, you know, held across their chests. The Browning Colt 45 would arguably become the most successful handgun in the world. I mean, the numbers are huge because by 1918, you've got over 425,000 M1911 pistols being sold. And by the end of the Second World War, that number, of course, is going to go even higher. And it goes to well over a million. But Colt wasn't just famous for its pistols. Its factory was at the forefront of another revolution in weapons design, made infamous by the First World War, the machine gun. So at the same time as you've got Browning designing this whole new breed of pistol for Colt, you've also got the Vickers Arms Manufacturing Company in Britain buying out Hiram Maxim and was converting his famous Maxim gun into the Vickers machine gun. The Vickers design for machine gun was in fact so good that rather than create its own version of it, the United States brought the design over to America and actually handed it over to the Colt company to build. Colt eventually produces more than 12,000 Vickers guns. They initially struggled to provide enough weapons in time for America's entry into the war in 1917. And actually, in fact, there were so few operational Vickers guns in service by 1917 that you've got new recruits being forced to train with dummy wooden models rather than the real thing. Not ideal, frankly. Demand was so great that Colt expanded its factory and employed large numbers of women to help in the war effort. If you look at photographs of the Colt Hartford factory during World War I, you see large numbers of men and women building M1911 handguns and the Vickers machine gun. It's an enormous project, it's an enormous factory. During that time, you got Hartford's industrial population growing massively from 20,000 to 30,000. And then you've got the yearly factory payroll jumping from about $14.5 million to $45 million. So it's basically trebling. But the Vickers was just the tip of the iceberg. 
During World War II, Colt also manufactures another firearm designed by the great John Moses Browning, a firearm called the ANM2 50 caliber machine gun. Every B-17 bomber or B-24 bomber that's in the sky is flying with ANM 250 caliber machine guns. Every P-51 Mustang or F-6F Hellcat or F-4U Corsair, they're flying with ANM 250 caliber machine guns. It's the true unsung hero of firearms production throughout World War II. And yet another truly revolutionary design by John Moses Browning would help carry America into a whole new era of infantry warfare. The collaboration of Colt and John Moses Browning didn't end with the 1911 pistol. They went on to produce together the Browning automatic rifle. 1917, it's the First World War, trench warfare. The Allies are trying to break through, become more dynamic. What Browning was proposing and what the army wanted was essentially an automatic rifle. So a rifle that wouldn't just fire a shot every time you pull the trigger, but would keep firing until you let go of the trigger. Big, heavy, cumbersome, but the idea was you would walk slowly towards the enemy with the gun on your hip, looking where you're aiming and firing, um, probably in short bursts, but you're fully exposed to the enemy. It's not actually the best way to use a weapon like this. And actually the tactics evolved to fit the gun. The Second World War is where this thing really shines by which time um, they've wised up a little bit. The walking fire thing is not happening. We have added a bipod, which is the critical piece of equipment, and a carrying handle, and that's enough to turn this into a very good light machine gun. It already has a 20 round detachable magazine. Press the button, out it comes. Fire your 20 shots, slap in 20 more, on you go. That's what you want for a light machine gun. And the troops Loved it. All told, this thing is in use from the end of the First World War, from 1918, all the way through to the 1970s, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, more modern, more specialist, better weapons emerge, but this thing is a great jack of all trades. It's reliable, it's bomb-proof, um, and it has a long service life. What Colt failed to realize is just what a step change their BAR had brought about. This was the first of a new era of firearms, the automatic rifle. And as Colt struggled to keep up, its star would be eclipsed by a new gun in town. Its name was Kalashnikov. In late 1941, a Soviet tank commander is recuperating in hospital when he hears some wounded soldiers complaining about their weapons. He hears them rabbiting on and they're saying that the rifles they had were old and antiquated and unreliable and there are never enough of them to go around. He felt frustrated that the Germans seemed to have better rifles that could kill more people more quickly than the Soviets did. The commander's name was Mikhail Kalashnikov an engineer who also dabbled in weapons design. And so he set out quickly after World War II to develop a high-speed rifle. that could be mass-produced in huge quantities, and what was really crucial could be really reliable and could operate in all weathers. And what he comes up with is the AK-47. That's the story. The truth is a little more complicated, and it has to do with factories. During World War II, the Soviet military was fighting with a number of different types of firearms. Rather than have one factory producing bolt-action rifles, and another factory producing pistols, and yet another factory producing this version of the submachine gun, they wanted something that could do it all. They wanted to make one firearm for everyone. Their solution came from a very surprising source, the Nazis. What the Germans realize, pretty much for the first time, when they invent literally the assault rifle, is that you need a rifle that's kind of dialed down a bit. And when the Soviet high command get wind of this, they go, ah, this could be the solution to our problem. 
So they launched a design competition. And in comes this really promising model. And it's from this young designer called Alexei Sudayev, who's developed automatic weapons for the defense of Leningrad. But unfortunately, he has a fever and dies before he can actually take this forward. So the Soviet high command passes his notes onto a design team, led by one Mikhail Kalashnikov. In 1947, they introduced a prototype. Its design was quite surprising. I mean, let's face facts, the Kalashnikov is incredibly rough and ready. It's got bits and bobs sticking out all over the place. It's not that smooth, streamlined shape of a traditional military rifle. Notably, you've got this gigantic curved bit of metal sticking out the bottom. You've got cheap-looking sheet metal all over the thing. It's no wonder, then, that when the American military got hold of a copy to evaluate, they were less than overwhelmed. They're really not impressed at all. You know, its individual parts are, are, are really quite heavy and they're fitted with really very loose tolerances. They were interested in the accuracy or lack thereof. They tested these things and they found them not accurate outside of 100 yards. But the evaluators were missing the point. Every ugly little detail is a deliberate part of the AK-47's design. Good gun design isn't just about creating a really accurate weapon, it's about creating a weapon that is just so reliable and cost-effective that you can put it into the hands of just about any soldier, no matter how much of an idiot he is, and they know how to make it work. The sites are quite close together. Again, the Americans would have looked askance at this. Sites further apart are more accurate. You can more precisely align them. Sites close together mean you can very quickly bring up the rifle, sight in your target and pull the trigger. And the magazine is curved. Well, that's there to account for the tapered shape of the cartridges. They pass smoothly up and into the action and are then thrown out with great force when they've been fired. That was a key design feature, actually, to have 30 rounds on the weapon and not have to reload. 30 rounds is three times what military rifles were carrying at that time. In truth, the Avtomat Kalashnikova 1947, or AK-47, was the product of a long, drawn-out process involving several different designers. But the Soviets wanted a better story, so Mikhail Kalashnikov became a hero of socialist labor, and his odd-looking gun became its savior, specially designed for the unique needs of the Soviet soldier. Freezing icy, snowy conditions, muddy, wet conditions, boiling hot conditions. The Soviet Union's territory encompassed all of these at different times of the year. For an effective military weapon, you need it to, to keep running in all of those conditions. And you've got to be able to fix this thing right out in the middle of nowhere, and there are a lot of middles of nowhere in Russia, and you don't have factories for thousands of miles. This thing feels quite wobbly and loose and rattles when you move it around. It has designed in uh, loose clearances between parts. So if mud, sand, dirt gets in there, it's liable to keep functioning regardless and to just ignore it and carry on. And that was designed in from the start. Kalashnikov becomes a superlative for rugged dependability. Everywhere and always people recognize that the AK-47, it will just run and it will never fail. More importantly, this is a weapon that can be easily mass produced so that you can equip your entire army. You no longer have this soldier armed with a rifle, this soldier is armed with a carbine, this soldier is armed with a submachine gun. Everyone carries the same type of firearm. And for the Soviet Union in the aftermath of the Second World War, that firearm was Mikhail Kalashnikov's AK-47. This need for mass production led to the adoption of an unusual production technique one pioneered a century earlier by another gun designer, Samuel Colt. The Soviets spent a decade figuring out how to use one sheet of metal where you simply just stamp or you cut a piece in the shape of a gun. You bend it under great pressure into a U-shaped box and you bolt all of the other bits you need, screw, rivet, all those bits, onto the sort of core of the gun. And of course, what this is doing is to cut down the cost of labour and raw materials so much that the average price of an AK-47 can be little more than about three to $500.
I mean, that is dirt cheap. More than 100 million copies were made, spread across the military and insurgent forces of at least 106 countries. And it's a game changer. What the AK-47 as a technology does is to give an enormous boost and an advantage to insurgent forces rather than the forces which are trying to maintain the established order. I mean, it's so ubiquitous, even some countries have it on their flags. In this way, the AK became a factory for insurrection. And nowhere was the AK-47's disruptive power more obvious than in Vietnam. What you've got are these kind of local farmers, you know, not properly trained, but they're armed with this rifle that shows the Americans that their M14s are incredibly cumbersome in jungle warfare. Eventually, the US military came to the conclusion that they needed a lightweight, fully automatic rifle of their own. They were going to have to invent their own Kalashnikov. So what Colt does is to team up with Armalite to create the now iconic M16. Now, the M16 is air-cooled, it's gas-operated, it's a magazine-fed assault rifle, and, of course, it's a lot more sophisticated than the AK-47. So, really, what we have here is a piece of precision design and engineering. It's wonderfully light, uh, beautifully made, latest alloys and, and polymers and all of that, great. There's only one problem. It doesn't work. The early models of the M16 were always sort of kind of clogging up and jamming in the jungle atmosphere, which is obviously really sort of fetid and sticky. And the soldiers simply saw it as a liability. The ultimate insult, um, there's a story of a gunnery sergeant walking through a camp. He's got an AK on his back, and a lieutenant colonel remarks, what are you doing carrying that gunny? And his response is, because it works, sir. Soldiers were picking up Kalashnikovs because the M16 was letting them down. One can argue that one of the reasons the communists won the Vietnam War and the Americans lost was because of the more reliable Kalashnikov. Eventually, Colt managed to fix the issues with their gun. Once those problems were resolved after 1968, they went away forever, and the M16 is a completely reliable weapon system. In fact, it's one of the most reliable weapon systems out there. But there is another reason why the AK-47 was so popular. Since it wasn't patented, you didn't have to pay for a license to make one. And that was very deliberate. From soldiers guarding the Berlin Wall and preventing East Germans from escaping, to people in Africa fighting for their independence from colonial powers, to countries in the Middle East, this is sort of the long arm of communism. But as the Cold War played out across the world, the inventors of the AK-47 would discover they had unleashed a Frankenstein's monster. The massive risk, of course, in proliferating your own weapon around the world is that the people you give them to might not necessarily agree with your outlook on things. Soon the guns were being used by guerrilla groups against the very governments that produced them. So we see in countless places, but um, notably in Afghanistan, those same Kalashnikovs that are provided to local fighters get turned on the Soviet troops when they come in in the late 70s. Mexican drug cartels or a more established group at this point, ISIS, they're all relying on AK-47s. So this Soviet invention is with us to this day. The AK is estimated to have caused an enormous amount of deaths. And in fact, it's often said that it's actually meant to have caused more deaths than artillery fire, airstrikes, and rocket attacks combined. Now, you know, some people think that actually probably about a quarter of a million people a year are gunned down by bullets that have come out of Kalashnikovs. One could argue that the factory that developed the Kalashnikov is one of the most successful ones of all time. It may not be a happy sign of success, but it certainly has proved um, the durability of the Kalashnikov. Colt and Kalashnikov, two names synonymous with death. One democratized gun ownership, the other democratized resistance. Both have changed the way the world works.